Hello and welcome to the Legends of Tabletop podcast. This is, ironically enough, episode 181. Uh, we were going to play Day Trippers tonight, but uh, the plan for that fell through. So that we'd uh, get Jesse and Todd on here and just kind of do sort of a random bullshit session. Uh, there are horrible things happening in the world today, and I think we're going to probably spend most of the episode touching in on that. But uh, before we jump into the heavy stuff, how are you guys doing? Ah, uh. <laughs> <laughs> all things considered. <laughs> well, you know, it would be it would be foolish not to recognize that there's a link between quarantine, coronavirus, and the behavior of people. And then along comes the murder of George Floyd, and we've all been pent up for months in our houses, and. Not only did this thing take off nationally, but it's taken off internationally. Mm -hmm. um, but but I'm a guy with a compromised immune system, 57 years old, and I want to be out there in the streets, but I, I don't want to be out there in the streets. Right. Yeah. You want to be out there in the streets, just not right now. <laughs> yeah. Like not with the conditions yeah. going on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, cause like all I, all I can do is, uh, you know, give advice from my history as an activist organizer and post stuff about tactics and ethics and cheer from the sidelines. Hmm. Right. And I, and I thought that this was a, a good conversation to have with, you because of your background, right? So like we're all, you know, relatively insulated, you know, middle-class bunch of white guys uh, where you have been an organizer where you've been out, you know, protesting and doing stuff where like, you know, we, you know, are, so, so, so let me back up then a little bit. Um, Cause we've never really for all intents and purposes, haven't discussed a lot of politics on the show. It's one of those things where you kind of like, you know, it's, you keep your head down. We're, you know, playing games and we're having fun and, you know, we're just not gonna, you don't want to rock the boat one way or the other. No, um, it's, it's between the lines though. I mean, all of yeah. my work has a political angle to it. Mm -hmm. um, but it is usually um, sarcastic and exaggerated, you know, um, uh, um, one of my favorite science fiction writers is Stanislaw Lem. And in his stories, he just basically goes beyond the ridiculous. I mean, the, uh, the, uh, any, you know, any technology sufficiently advanced is, is uh, indistinguishable from magic mm -hmm. kind of a thing, right? And that allows you to take an almost surrealist approach, right? His, his I almost said comedy. His science fiction is so comedic uh, and so over the top but it manages to make deep human points in the in the notes of the satire mm -hmm. and the irony, right? You get to see the corporate dystopia exposed through humor. Mm. And Day Trippers, for instance, has a lot of that. Yep. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big thing. If you try too hard to just show things to people and to not shove it down their throat necessarily, but to be like, look at this, like, this is the truth. This is what you need to look. I think a lot of times people will shut their eyes. They won't pay attention because you're trying to feed them information. But oh, yeah. if even you try if, to subvert even if they agree if you with the information, joke, even exactly. if they agree with the information, there's a point at which it becomes artless proselytizing. Right. Exactly. But if you, if you, if you veil it in something else, if you put sarcasm behind it or make, the world around it so extreme and so absurd you can, slowly, you can let those ideas kind of just subconsciously float in yeah i just read we're you know uh we just read a book to the girls uh to my daughters the other night that was about two race cars it was about a black race a black car and a white car and how they you know were in a race and they love to race but the committee that uh, that ran the races was all white cars, and they didn't like that a black car had placed third place. And so it was all about like the committee of white cars 
creating roadblocks and like diverting the black car so like oh well the black cars have to like all the non-white cars have to take this path all the non-white cars have to stop <laughs> and it's like they like me and my wife are like yeah this is but and they're like they're ingesting all they have you know and we've talked to them about what's going on and everything um but like that's well, what okay. you need Sometimes to do you're, it's you're, like <laughs> your your polemic becomes like you're now you're not writing a story you're you're writing an allegory a political allegory Right. Yeah. And, and at a certain point, you know, yes, it becomes artless proselytizing, but you're talking about a children's book. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, I don't even want to say excuse. I want to say that's a viable tactic when yeah, dealing absolutely. With, with, with young minds. You know, it's just like, you know, little kids, they get the big clunky Legos that are easy to <laughs> assemble, right? Because they've got little hands and their dexterity is low. Right, they get the big clunky Legos. We can work to finesse later. Right. You know, but if that same story, well, or if something like that story was presented as a mainstream work of science fiction, uh, people would just be like, you know, can you gag me with your political messaging? <laughs> right. And I agree with you. I'm not. It's not even that I'm opposed to what you're saying. It's just this. This isn't art. You might as well write a manifesto. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and I think a lot of people just get offended if you bring up, you know, anything. You know, keep keep your politics out of my games. Keep your politics out of my RPGs. Keep your politics out of my movies. But you know, like you said, everything everything is political in some fashion or another. Like mm -hmm. this is this is a very weird tangent. But I just finished watching Altered Carbon, hmm. the first two seasons, which that's been coming up a lot lately. And, yeah. it, and it was good, right? It was a, it was a good drama series, whatever. But on the meta level, it was so much more interesting. In that, you know what you know what is that you know dh what is that does, it, does that make us not human? Does it make it something more than human? So like, you know it's it's. You know, and the, and the politics and all the other stuff is just sort of woven into the story. You don't go, ah, I don't want to watch Altered Carbon because, you know, they're making me question, you know, humanity or whatever. Like, that's the interesting part of it. Like, the show yeah. was good. Yeah, it was fine. I enjoyed it. But Black like, Mirror. That other thing. stuff. Black Mirror. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which I, that is, I watched. Uh, you, can, you, can tell, <laughs> it, you can tell that is the writer's goal is to make people think that way. But they do it. In such a subtle, I mean, it's not even necessarily subtle, but they they don't. Uh, Bucking a pig's they don't make it a They don't make it a direct point of the story, so they still get their goal of getting you to think about that stuff. But you don't go into it being like, "Well, I'm gonna learn about you know how people treat each other and about how screwed up our dystopian future can be if we don't change it now." Like. Well, what, Todd, maybe you you might know the exact quote. I, I sort of vaguely paraphrase. I don't know who said it, but that that art should make you angry, right? Like that's the you, it should provoke some reaction, you know, positively or negatively. If it doesn't affect you in some way, then then it hasn't done the you know hasn't hasn't done its job. Yeah, well, you know, in sort of a, a anthropological mythological way um there are traditionally like two two main purposes of story now we narrativize our lives and so we understand the world in terms of stories and we understand our lives in terms of stories we want to feel like we're there's a goal that we're that we're shooting for there's a twist that makes the story even juicier it's, it's, this is this is the way that we learn to remember things so stories are there to, to deliver a point, a message, or a, a, even an ideology wrapped up in a, in a fictional package that makes it appealing, interesting, etc. cetera. Um, but stories are also there uh, in a way that it sort of exists before language in a sort of a collective consciousness sort of way. And we can debate about whether that's pan-human or pan-cultural or differs by culture. I think there's levels to it. 
But at some core level, there are symbols which you find throughout history, throughout prehistory, on all continents that all have similar symbolic meanings and placement. And it's clear that this indicates some sort of very, very low level shared human understanding. These are the archetypes, is what Jung called them. Mm -hmm. And so stories serve that purpose too, to bring up from the collective unconscious the, the themes which we impart to our children as they grow. Then I guess each culture comes along and spins those in different ways. Like every culture has trickster archetypes, you know, and to the, uh, the Native Americans, there's the coyote figure. Um, but, you know, the, 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 you've also got the Loki figure. You've got leprechauns. Um, I'm, yeah, I can probably think, or maybe one of you guys can think of, uh, oh, yeah, we've got uh, Br'er Rabbit. There's an, I was trying to think of an American one. Okay, so the trickster archetype exists. And so one of the reasons we tell stories is to wrap messages up. But another reason we tell stories is because these stories are the way we understand the world. And at the root of all these stories are archetypes which every human being recognizes and shares. And so there's a, there's a bonding element to the fact that humans tell stories. And it, um, I think that cats and dogs and monkeys and, you know, I think they're definitely conscious, but um, I'm less inclined to think that they understand the world in terms of unfolding narratives over time. That's something unique. Yeah, that's, that's sort right. of the curse yeah. that we have. And one of the reasons, because um, I think about this uh, a lot, like trying to, I don't think of, of role-playing game design uh, as a as a, a, a fixed entity or a, I don't think of role-playing games as um, a closed set of possible types of games. In fact, I, I've always seen role-playing as only one, you know, like the metaphor about the tip of the iceberg. This is a huge iceberg. It's actually like a mountain range made out of icebergs. And there's a couple tips popping up from the surface. And people actually think they're completely separate types of game. But there's, there's all these other tips below the surface that we haven't even started to look at. Smaller peaks and valleys, crevices. This entire body is basically the, the making of story. There's ways to mechanize it. One of the earliest ways we found out is to put somebody in charge of everything that's not an individual. We called that role playing. But then time goes by, we get versions of role playing. It splits into simulationism, gameism, and narrativism. Some people are more interested in the story than the characters per se. Some people are more interested in theme and arc and feeling than they are about simulating the swing of a sword or the arc of a bullet and those seem like different types of games but in between and around there is a huge gestalt of basically simulating stuff the stuff can be real stuff like simulating the physical world or the stuff can be mental stuff like simulating a genre or simulating the arc of a television sitcom those are also things to simulate right when you say simulate, you may be talking about a physical circumstance. You may be talking about uh, a mental circumstance or a whole set of circumstances. And you take like Ursula Le Guin's Wizard of Earthsea, you've got both. You've got a, a physical circumstance that's very different, and you've got a cultural symbolic circumstance that's very different. What does it mean to, to be a wizard in this world where wizards are actually a thing that you can become? Uh, magic is is real, and therefore all the laws of nature sh have to shift a little bit. Your understanding of the world has to change. So she's able to tell you things that keep you interested on a physical level, and at the same time also make you think in a more abstract level. There's nothing wrong with simulating anything of any kind. It's ridiculous to see arrows hurled from one iceberg peak to the other, saying you're not really a what a game. What is a game? Right. Uh, all a game is, is uh, an unnecessary difficulty willfully undertaken. 
right? That's that's the uh, you cannot get any more precise than that, and still be describing anything from football to chess to Dungeons and Dragons, hmm. right? A game like a little game you play with yourself when you're washing the dishes to make the time go by. You know, let's see if we can do this one faster, or let's invent a sports announcer voice and play it in our head as we're washing the dishes. It's a game. Why are you doing that? You're actually sim making a simulation of the thing you're doing at the moment. You're creating an artificial, this is an unnecessary difficulty. You're adding mm -hmm. complexity to the task, but you find it entertaining. Why? Because it helps you make sense of things. I mean, that's what our, that's what we do when we, you know, it's almost like a waking sleep. Like our brains, when we sleep, process everything they simulate real life or at least extrapolate the best they can to practice to enhance and to better understand the world around us and how we envelop in it right and so and we're it's not just doing, about we're doing that in real world. life yeah, yeah it's not just about the physical world in fact when it comes to yeah. dream material it's mostly about the feeling right of phenomenology not the phenomenology yeah. itself because the phenomenology can make no sense at all. I mean, surrealism works this way. <laughs> Visit to the multiversal cow works this way. Uh, but, the, but the feeling of it is just as real as the seeing of it. So this gets mm -hmm. us back to the, the sunken part of the iceberg. Most of it is comprised of things we don't even have words for. So when it, when it finds its way into a game, it's almost an accident or it's an, it's an individual GM that's like really good at this kind of thing or just a human trick that we don't even have a word for. The ability to make somebody feel this particular kind of thing in this particular kind of situation. We don't even have a language for this. Psychology, you know, only depth psychology gets there and Jung is... I love Jung, but I, I understand why a lot of people have a lot of problems with Jung. If you're trying to approach psychology from a scientific perspective, Jung is not going to help you much. <laughs> but that gestalt is the thing that, 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 that drives everything I've ever done in a creative sense. Like from, mm -hmm. from, my, uh, from Space Master, like really crunchy old school trad gaming uh all the way up to you know the more narrative and free flow improvisational stuff that i do with day trippers but also outside of rpg to hyper theater which i, I produced four interactive theatrical experiences in the 90s uh, to the stuff that i did online in uh, like the world of south park where i had a staff and we would actually act out scripts in shows for people online to interact with with their avatars written or drawn in the south park style uh, getting the audience to interact with the storyline. Sometimes uh, it was a, an actual show. Like we had costumes and regular schedules and would do these shows like a trivia game with the rest of the crowd watching and speaking avatar co cartoon bubbles coming out of their heads. Uh, or sometimes we would just do like sort of Ren Faire improv, run around the chat site. This is the two-dimensional graphical chat site where people wore avatars that looked like South Park and you made your own. We had hundreds of heads and shirts and pants and skirts and props. You just assembled your own avatar. It was interactive theater, in a sense. Uh, and we were, in fact, playing roles. There were no dice. There was no probability. It was all completely freeform. But it was a game in the sense that those of us on the staff knew where we were taking the story. We, we didn't know how people were going to respond to it. We didn't know which branch we might push when we got to a certain point. But we had sort of a skeletal outline of a story, and the audience didn't know it. And by experiencing it without knowing it was a script, they are spin like a role player in an in a RPG. They're spinning the narrative in directions that we hadn't thought of. And it becomes fun for us on a whole other level now. It's fun yeah. on one level because we're kind of, we're acting, we're playing, we're faking you out. But then it becomes fun on a whole other level when it starts feeding back. Yeah. Uh, one thing that was interesting about that is that, um, like when I did my hyper theater games, everybody was assigned a character. Uh, the rules got simpler and simpler. I started off with 
way too many rules. There was, I mean, it's not like I uh, approach people with dice or anything, but we had a series of questions that we asked you before coming in and we would choose your character type based on a Myers-Briggs indication, uh, your profession, how much money you had, a clue, and um, something you were looking for. And, and every person got one of those. And we had like 200 people through this place in the space of eight hours. While I've got people in makeup playing roles in this futuristic party, the opening of telespace, the world's first virtual space. Um, and then, of course, there's a murder mystery kind of a thing going on where there's uh, there's secrets being passed around. There's all sorts of ties between other characters, dirty money being laundered. Uh, the Russians, because at the time we were still worried about the Russians all the time. <laughs> oh, we still are. To okay. be fair, <laughs> yeah. the fashion to be scared of Russians again. Okay, that's good. That's good. I might get a second leg of life out of this fucker. Every, everything goes out of style and then comes back in. Comes back in again. Yeah. Uh, so those people, of course, knew they were playing a role playing game. They had a piece of paper in their hand, represented their character. Later, as time went by, I made the stuff simpler and simpler until by the by the fourth show, you did have a character, you did have a piece of paper in your hand, but but there was we didn't talk about scores or points or uh, questions or anything. It was all kind of done uh, in a very improvisational way. And yet you knew you were playing a character in a fictional world. And then we get into the South Park work where you, you're playing a character you invented yourself. You're, that character is the asshole you are when you're in an online chat. <laughs> that's, that's the character you're playing. Um, but you don't know you're in a game. You know you're in a fictional world, but you don't know you're in a script. Mm. And it's a really interesting thing to look at to realize that, you know, in a way, for a role-playing game to work, the players don't even really need to know they're playing. This is part of that submerged part of the ice, you know, it, it's just like... You don't usually think about things like this, but it's built into the definitions of the games and the formats that you defend and sometimes even fight against and enjoy struggling with. It's There are so many unspoken forms of art that involve simulating an experience mm -hmm. that to say, well, there's story games and there's treader RPGs is to miss 99% of the forest. We haven't even invented the words for the shit. But one of the reasons I find all of this so appealing goes back to, to story, the ability to connect with someone in a way that's, yes, verbal, but but beyond verbal, like, some, like on the meaning level, on the get, gestalt level. Role-playing games are, at this point anyway, because, you know, it's progress is slow. People tend to copy what someone else did rather than try something new. Yeah. And I guess capitalism has something to do with that because you want to try to make it big in the market. So you I follow look at the success. movie industry. Yeah. The most, <laughs> yeah. most, the movie industry is all about either remaking old movies or taking other content that you know is already popular and yeah. turning it into a movie. Yeah. And so it's not surprising to see that games go the same way. In fact, we're, we're nowhere near as bad as a lot of other creative media when it comes to no. that. You know, you do see new genres and new types uh, of games appear once in a while. You rarely see new plot structures or new types of experimental films coming out of Hollywood. That just doesn't happen. Right. No. But I can take a person, I can take you guys, and I can drop you into a world. Believe it or not, I'm looping back to the original point. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking in my head, how am I going to edit this to make it all make sense? <laughs> you I, can drop you, I can drop you into a world where, uh, yeah, there's physical stuff that I'm simulating, but also there's this giant submerged iceberg, this huge gestalt of unspoken, but if you think about it for half a second, you realize, oh, yeah, well, <laughs> it's, actually, it's actually kind of a corporate dystopia, isn't it? It would have to be. It would have to be. And I'll give you a little glimpse of it once in a while, but it's not the purpose of it. The purpose of it is to sink you in there and let you feel what you feel. You're going to be the thing that provides that feedback and makes it come alive for me. Right? I make it alive for you. You make it alive for me. We feed off of each other. The world grows. Most of the stuff that we understand about that fictional world just like most of the stuff we understand about this real world. It's completely nonverbal. We don't even have words for it. It's a feeling 
It's an understanding. It's a connection that you never even said, but the other person got it. And and role playing is what what other art form can do that to you? What other art form can literally sink you into a completely not only physical but emotional and mental environment and allow you to draw your own connections from that, which then feed back into the actual art. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's nothing like that, man. And well, as we get better wanted, and better yeah. with like Neuralink, imagine if you had Neuralink. <laughs> what the kind of shit that I would be talking about right now. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I love about the about it too is that it's all about it's nothing grows without interaction. It's a, you know you were saying about you know the the feed loop of of the creation of the story and of the of the general world. I is can that make the world interesting, the, but players make it alive. Exactly. And that it's yeah. it's through the interaction with those two people or with those two sides that really makes it happen. It's like a, a the GM can write all they want about the world. But it's it, as long as there's no interaction, it's flat. There's no there. There's the only substance is it is what the is what that one person added to it. It's the yeah, same thing is, as if reading it's a, if you, very if close to the academic description of the world. It is a scientific yeah. description of a bunch of objects. Exactly. And it's the same thing with a, if I read, if I write a book, I can write a book, but it is very two dimensional. It's what I think about it. It's not, the world doesn't really become alive until other people begin putting their, read the book, interact with it and begin to put their input and their personality into it as well. Nothing now, really that, actually is comes a, alive a very and grows until other people look at it. I wonder, I feel like that's a very modern perspective. Like I know personally, and I know a lot of writers who feel the same way, they will, and I will, uh, feel a, 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 a high watermark has been achieved when someone creates a piece of fanfic mm-hmm. based on based on a world that I created, right? Yeah. Uh, that's, that's important. But... I think that's kind of new. I think the internet did that. Yeah. Oh, because yeah. Before that, fan, you know, fanfic. Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think I honestly, I think it might have existed before then. Oh, but it, it was a very personal. It was a personal experience. It was something that it was something stories, that people with no shared. real confidence in their writing ability would do. Or people right. who had sexual fantasies about Kirk and Spock or whatever. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, and like, gonna... what are you going to do? What are you going to do beyond that? Like before the age of the internet, what are you going to do? Are you going to send your, the story that you, the, the micro story that you've created in this world to the author? Oh, of no. course not. I, You're I not going to have that the, type of confidence. Prior to the internet, the literary world actually meant something. Right. Right. The world of literature viewed what we today call for better or worse. (laughs) uh, It's basically homemade literary pornography. I mean, no better. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, well, when you were talking about the, you know, the RPGs and storytelling, given that, that feedback loop, and you say, well, what other, you know, what other, um, uh, art form does that? And, you know, in a good movie, a good TV show, a good book, it takes you right to that precipice, but then it, it lacks the feedback. But but then when Jesse, you know, brought up the part about, you know, fanfic and like, you know, sort of interacting and, and sort of processing on your own side. So like you write a story and, and maybe that's two dimensional. And when the person then reads it, sort of like fills in the gaps with their own, you know, personal experiences and stuff like Charles DeLint. I just finished reading. Uh, the wind in his heart. It's been out for a couple of years, and I that motherfucker. Every time I read his books, I cry, like just mm-hmm. like it randomly in the middle of a book. Like it'll just it it just it hits, and he's so good at it, and it and it just and and whether it's you know talking about what Jesse was, where like you just put a part of yourself the into reader it. Of, the reader of the book or the or the viewer of the movie though rarely has a chance to feed back into the world of the creative process. The now, genre, if, there's a, yeah. if there's a sequel and the author listens to his fans, then that can happen. But yeah. traditionally speaking, it's kind of a one-way street. 
Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Where the interaction occurs, though, and I didn't think of this till just now, the interaction occurs among audience members after having read it or seen it. Right. And that's when you have a chance to inject your, you made a connection in your head and you're not sure the author intended it, but you think they did. And here's why, you know, as you all talk on forums and book reading clubs and all of that, together we spin the rest of the world, the stuff the author left unsaid. But, but in, in a role playing game, game that happens, happens now. That moment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only medium where you. All right. And so this happened. I'll I'll, I'll give an uh, an example of uh, behind. I'm not. I'm not nearly as good a planner as anybody might think I am. I don't think I am. But. <laughs> um, so for our podcast, for Monster Hunt, right? Pure example of world creation and feeding off each other in the moment mm -hmm. when you guys came across the gems on your second go around, right? And Megan said, I wonder if these are eggs. It was just a side throw off comment that she had made. But mm -hmm. in that moment, I said, that's a great idea. Bing. That's what's happening now. <laughs> right. <laughs> And so it was just this, it is her fault. <laughs> and so, but that's, that's only stuff through, through con, through, through conversation and development of ideas in person at that moment, you are world building in real time. And that's something exactly. that only happens in role playing games. Exactly. And one of the things I try to do very consciously in day trippers um, I don't always manage to pull it off, but you guys are good enough so that the show is still always entertaining. Um, in Day Trippers, I take that and, and I, I not only tell the GM as a principle, be, do this, right? Let the player's ideas just sort of form the world, but we call it psychic content. And I go even further than what if those are eggs? Uh, I'll use that as an example, though, because she said, what if they're eggs? And as a, as a day trippers GM, what I hear of that is what she's scared of is that they're eggs. Mm. That's a lot more fruitful. Yeah. It's because now I, have, now I have fear as a handle. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So it's, so it's not just... Uh, because because I totally agree with you. I mean, way back in the day when I was running my D and D campaigns, and somebody would come up with an idea. Hey, maybe this is the same dude who like our other party met on the bridge last time. Do you remember that? And in my head, I go, "Oh, that's a mind blower." Yes, it is the same dude, but I'm not going to reveal that until he pulls his mask off later. Right? Uh, the the idea came from a player, but in Day Trippers, it's not just an a, a, an object in the world or a connection but rather a, a feeling or a piece of psychic mm -hmm. content, psychic content. That's, right? That's why I call it that. Cause it could be anything. It could be a fear. It could be a symbol. It could be a relationship. Um, I had a, a long playing D and D character. The guy had a, an estranged relationship with his father. Um, he was a homophobe and his brother was gay. So he had a complicated relationship with his brother and a strong need to act out male bonding in a mm. truly deep brotherly or fatherly way. And if done right by a compassionate soul, GMing can be like an act of therapy. I mean, for yep. years, I, I, this guy would call me up sometimes and say, I need a game. Like mm. I just had a really stressful day. Or I just had an argument with my dad and I need a game. And he would come over and we'd, like two in the morning, you know, play till dawn. He he literally needed it. Like, like I, like a person with a chemical imbalance needs to take their medication. Mm. And all of the themes that we work through, they always touched on this brotherly bond, it, this male bond. It was just so important to him that I made it the centerpiece of his character's thread. And it, mm. he was, we never discussed it. Consciously, we never discussed it yeah. in real time. The game was how I helped my friend work out his ideas about male bonding. 
it's it's way deeper than um gee what if they're eggs or what if that's the same <laughs> right because <laughs> right? in day trippers like the surrealists of old um yeah i understand that you need you need a world to look at you need objects to play with you need a veneer but but the veneer is not where any of the important shit happens all mm -hmm. of the important shit happens in that psychic level underneath and what the veneer means to you. Yeah. And I'm, and that, and that's such a credit to you as a, as a game designer as, uh, and as a GM, because it's the, the day trippers game is the best game I've ever been in. I mean, it's the, yeah. the strongest game with the best characters, the most meaning, you know, mm -hmm. you know, some of the themes and stuff that we... That because the meaning comes through. from you. If I made up a thing right. and I said, hey, <laughs> you have this girlfriend and you feel ambivalent about relationships, it's like, well, yeah, you would, you'd play with it, but you, you wouldn't play in it. Yeah, yeah. You know, it has to come from you if you're going to really feel it. And I know that there are people who, I mean, shit, maybe we should put content warnings on day trippers games. I don't know, because... I deliberately try to go for the the deep shit. I I like yeah. bleed and and I like playing with players who like bleed, but I know yeah. that's not everyone's cup of tea. Yeah, and uh, you know, to uh, that's what I like. So all right, in the <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to focus my thought for a second. <laughs> So in the in, in the tabletop society as a whole and the people who play and the GMs who run the thing I the thing I think I like the most is that regardless of uh political views or or anything I know that the society as a whole tends to lean you know whatever left I'm trying to poke <laughs> oh <laughs> you you've, know, but, you've read your mold bug <laughs> yeah. So I know, but regardless of any of your views, where you are, who you are, uh, orientation, anything like that, the one thing I think we all share because of the because of role play is a deeper level of empathy. Is because we're used because we're used to we're used to putting ourselves in not only the situation of another person's mind, but also every, and I know like psychologists have looked into this as well, is like the characters that you create don't come out of nowhere. They come right. from a piece of you and with a good DM and a good group of people around you, it feeds into that and you're able to look into yourself a little more exactly. and also open yourself up to what, other situations might feel like as well putting yourself into that situation one and so i think the, that one of the live theater games i ran was called world of ideas and we ran it at a homeless shelter in downtown los mm -hmm. angeles so there was a crowd of uh, about 40 uh homeless people now this shelter took in people they considered transitional that is people who just needed a place to stay but they were training for a yep. job or they had a job offer they willfully wanted to make their way back into the mainstream of society mm -hmm. And uh, this place would help them get work and then save half of their money while they were there so that they had a nest egg, they could move into an apartment, mm -hmm. et cetera. So transitional homeless people. And uh, the game I ran for them was called World of Ideas. And by this time, I had stripped the system down. And it's funny, that this, I, the same thing happened to me in uh, published RPGs, right? The, the first stuff that I published, the stuff that I wrote for Iron Crown, there's a phone call. <laughs> oh, it's my daughter. I have to get this thing. Sure. Yep. I'll show me. <laughs> so this is this is where we get the editing in. <laughs> oh. I'm gonna I'm gonna mute him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we got way off tangent real quick. I, I thought we were going one way and then it's like a hard right. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry i know for a fact that it will this will all this is the setup to something this is how think of think of it like a game of day trippers <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I don't, I, this I'll probably edit this part out. Oh yeah, this whole red friend that come back. No one, no one gives a shit what we're talking about. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it was, I mean, it's fascinating because he's so involved in so many different things to hear. You know where everything is coming from. It's mm-hmm. yeah. Oh, I think he's back. Oh. Okay, so I'll try to seam this back in so you can cut and paste. Okay. <laughs> um, I, it's interesting that I followed the same trajectory in uh, published RPGs, meaning that the first games that I wrote for Iron Crown, super crunchy, super sim, right? The idea was to, uh, as much as possible, simulate the physical realities in very complex math, blah, blah, blah. And almost no attention paid to the narrative structure at all, totally left to the GM. By the time uh, I do day triggers, that's 2014. So there's like well, 25 years in between those two games. Uh, day trippers focuses mostly on narrative, most of which is improvised in real time. It provides only loose prompts and has only one mechanic. The same thing happened in my theater games. You know, the, the more I go, the more I realize... Strip down the mechanics, man. Strip them down, strip them down. Make it simpler, make it simpler, make it simpler. Until what you're left with is just a skeleton for human beings to do that marvelous thing they can do when their brains are jiving on the same level. Mm -hmm. And so we took these homeless people and gave them a super simple system that allowed them to be uh, people with tremendous power in this world. Some of them chose to be politicians, CEOs, astronauts, athletes. That kind of thing. And we gave them gigantic bank accounts. And we had one member of the staff playing the the bank, one member of the staff playing the market, the stock market. Um, Mm. One member of the bank uh, played the federal government. Uh, We had one person who ran for president and won. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, You know, so we simulated an election. We had one person try to assassinate the president and got arrested. (laughs) And we had we had people Mm. who like decided to they were going to be a movie maker and in the game you would need i had all sorts of tasks listed out and all sorts of cards that represented resources of different types you could have money there was play money or you could have resources like um you know uh state-of-the-art computer system or uh production bay um there were vehicles and tools and whole teams of construction workers of various types, teams of scientists of various types. If you had the money, because they were all playing very powerful people, you just bought these things, lock, stock, and barrel. Like you could buy a whole laboratory and set it to work on your project. And then at the end of the project, when enough game time had passed, you would come to me and I had a chart where you would in fact roll dice and you would get mods based on how much resources you'd thrown into the project. And then your project would succeed or fail. If you succeeded, you'd make shit tons of money. And then every, we also had a news reporter who was going around with a video camera and we were watching on closed circuit TV. So that would be like the news. So if your project succeeded, you'd end up on the news. Everybody in the room knew that you, it was a little simulation of the powerful level of society. And the whole theme was that really the only thing that separates you from the super rich is that they have money. The world is made of ideas. And here's a way to get your ideas into play. I had people coming up to me uh, after the show, and I had people emailing me for weeks after the show, about a half a dozen people who told me that it was a life-changing, eye-opening experience for them. Most Mm. of these people had never even seen a role-playing game. Um, I never used the words role-playing game. Uh, To them, it was uh, probably something that felt more like a, like a, a the way that a psychotherapist or a group therapist would would say the word role play, right? Yeah. And exactly like you were saying a minute ago, Jesse, that they were able to by stepping aside from themselves, they were able to view themselves. Uh, one woman told me, for instance, that in the real world, she's been trying to break into writing, and she's gone to conferences, and she's really timid, and she prevent pre, she prevents her own success. By being so timid that she's like scared to walk up to the publisher and hand him a copy or shake his hand or whatever. Mm. But in the fictional world, she's decided to do the opposite of that. 
and just play like a person with huge ego and tremendous confidence. And she made millions of dollars and sold a <laughs> fictional book that got turned into a movie. And it made her look at herself from outside of herself. And I mean, I'm applauding because that's exactly the purpose. Mm -hmm. But, but inwardly, any GM who's done this for a while knows, like Jesse said a minute ago, uh, the person you pretended to be for a minute didn't come from nowhere. That's in you. Mm -hmm. You feel like you're getting off the hook because it's, it's this piece of paper. It's, you know, this isn't me. This is my guy. So I'm just doing what he would do, right? Right. No, no, no. Secretly, that's in you. That came from you. Mm -hmm. So that's what you would do if your circumstances were a little different. Exactly. And that's what, you know, I've, for the longest time, I tried to tell myself, like, I don't put my, like, I choose uh, characters that go to extremes because I like to, uh, I like to test out like what that would be like, but that's not me. Like, that's not what yeah, I but do. Even, but, but even so, but, your take on a raging barbarian is going to be different than John's take on a raging barbarian. Right. right. But like, but in, in doing so, I'm saying, it, you know, is it that I like, what is the point of me taking all these characters and pushing them to the limit? Like what does me take, like if I take a priest, if I play a priest, I don't just play like a run of the mill kind of ordinary. Like I take it and go like, I'm not religious at all, but I take it and push it to the extreme of mm -hmm. what it means to be a completely pious. Like there's nothing to look at, but this viewpoint. And or, by doing like, that, you gain that empathy that you were talking right. about. Right, you have to let like, that what, happen to you. I think some people exactly. don't let it happen to you. You know. Yeah. Um, there is, uh, I, John, for instance, looking at you, John, um, very rarely uses the word "I." He says "he," mm -hmm. so he's a third-person camera looking at his character. All right. Once in a while, he's. You know, I'm going to make him conscious of it now. <laughs> Once in a while, he says, I, and when he says, I, I know that he is really deep in. I really mm -hmm. got him. Yeah. Well, I, I had this conversation with Jesse once before, probably multiple times before, just laughing and say, you know, if, if I look at look back at the history of characters that I've played, they're usually, you know, drunks, you know, uh, not necessarily alcoholics, but, you know, like drink and screw and swear and smoke. And, you know, see, I don't know what that says about me because I'm, I'm not <laughs> those things. And and you had something insightful to say, and I can't remember it now, but it struck me as not, not that you want to be that person. I forget what it was that you said, but I was like, damn, I hadn't looked at it. It was like the inverse of what, you know. Well, you know what I think of my, it's, it's the, it's, it's not even necessarily the desire, but you, it's something that you can't necessarily do in real life. We have the, yeah. and I, I know exactly we are, we are at, at our hearts. We are responsible people. We have things we need to do. Mm -hmm. And so there are paths that we cannot take because we have a responsibility and in playing characters like that, it allows you to be that person without having to have any of the in life, the real life repercussions. Ramifications, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And none of them Which were necessarily in general bad is for, right? I mean, like you can, you could say on one level, uh, football is simulated warfare and it's mm -hmm. a way to, it's a way to get your war on without anybody getting shot. Right. Right. No, I think or, or I, chess, I think you see chess a, is a way yeah. to get your war right. on without even having to stand up. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yep. you know, I think that's what uh, there's. Uh, that's what's so good about introducing. You know, I came into role playing games super late in life. You know, I was in my late, I think my like late twenties by the time I actually came across anything. But I think that's the great thing about about giving them to younger kids 
because it allows them to explore so many different things without oh, yeah. actually having to decide what they want to be. Like I can, you don't see this a lot in, in adults anymore. You don't see it like most of the time, if you play a character, that character pretty much resembles you. Like if I'm going to play a character, it's going to most likely, unless I make it a conscious decision, it's going to be a straight white man. Right. But in early in life, it allows you to challenge that and it allows you to be different things. I don't have to be a man. I don't have to be a woman. I don't have to be any like I can be nothing. I don't have to be straight. I don't have to be gay. I don't have to be black or white or tan or anything like I can be whatever I want or nothing I want. And RPGs allow you to do that. Like story. Now you take the take the role playing out. Storytelling in general allows you mm -hmm. to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think the whole like strip out the mechanics thing mm -hmm. that happened to me in theater games and also happened in RPG is, is about recognizing that, about recognizing where the true value is coming from. And the true value is coming exactly. from the people around the table. And uh, if you want to energize that, um, then mechanics are the last thing you actually want uh, because they get in right. the way. They, so you don't want to you don't want to break the you don't want to to break that boundary. Once you have some and now we kind of we understand it because we've been playing role playing games for a while. But you don't want the yeah, yeah but it definitely helps <laughs> the, the, the it definitely the, helps the, in day the, the that there's there's yeah. only one there's only one mechanic. Once right. you've once you've rolled a, a couple things any anything anything mm -hmm. you know how the dice work and they're always going to work that way and you can stop thinking about it. You well, don't have to the, go, wait a minute, the, great thing I, about I think the that, table yeah. for that is on page 84, unless you're approaching with force. <laughs> if you're approaching with force, we use the with force rule, which is on page 92. Right. I think the great thing about stripped down systems like that is that it allows the, the breaking of storytelling by rolling dice is so infrequent that you roll once and that one roll lasts for as long as you want it to. Until until the situation changes again, that re, that requires if, if the DM says requires another die roll, another roll of chance. Well, but like but even, in theory, the DM could even let that roll. You could roll a D six and then just let that slide for however long you want. Well, it depends on the situation. If you guys are, are in, if you guys are in a. I'm just going to go ahead and say dungeon, but imagine an allegory for a super yeah. science fiction, futuristic kind of a dungeon thing, right? There's there's security systems to bypass. There's locks to pick. There's doors to open. All these are going to require rolls. Oh, yeah. Um, but there's just one mechanic to remember. You internalize it pretty quickly. And and then on the other on the other end, the other boon of that particular mechanic is that it's, it's flexible anyway. So rather right. than... Rather than front loading with a bunch of specificities, are you approaching with force or are you simply, <laughs> you know, um, and then having to do a bunch of math beforehand? I just let the chaos go into the dice and figure it out after. Did you get an and? Oh, okay. Well, you tell me what it was. Mm -hmm. Well, but even for our crunchier systems that we play, like Rogue Trader, um, I mean, we'll, we go whole sessions and don't roll dice. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes I feel like we probably should. Sometimes I'll say, Hey, do you want me to like fucking roll a charm on that or whatever? Mm -hmm. Because we just, we play in the moment and we play to the characters. We're storytellers. We're yeah, more <laughs> storytellers. I mean, rogue trader is crunchy as all fucking get out. And, and unless we're in combat and then, you know, sometimes, Oh, what does this power do? What is that thing? We'll have to like look things up you know, in the moment, but I mean, if, if it's yeah, not, but basically it comes down to um, dice rolls are only necessary in situations where a success is not guaranteed and B failure is interesting mm -hmm. because if failure is not interesting, 
Mm. Don't roll dice. You're not entertaining anybody. Yeah. Uh, right. And if success is not possible, then you're just being an illusionist and fucking with your players' heads. But if both of those things are true, there's narrative potential. And if there's narrative potential, then that's good. Even a failure can be good as long as it's interesting. Yeah. But if uh, you know, but if there's not some sort of, if there's not some sort of pressure or uh, narrative consequence, if you're trying to pick the lock on a door of a room that I know has nothing in it, and no one's chasing you, and no one's watching you, and you could be here all night if you wanted to, it was stupid to make you roll for that. Say, well, eventually you get it open. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right, because it's not interesting to fail, and there's no pressure to make you succeed, so it's not narratively important. Yeah, unless you need to do it on a, like a time frame, like you're being chased by somebody, or uh, you know, you you've, you're on some kind of a like. Well, see, that makes that off. makes failure interesting. If yeah, you yeah, fail, right. that means they spotted you. Right, right, right. You know, failure has to be interesting. Otherwise, just just say no. Or suggest something else, and mm -hmm. it usually—I mean, it usually is right. Like with with a good GM and good players, that failure is almost always more interesting than even just the success. Like you beat the monster, you know, D and D parlance, You know, you 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 slay all the goblins. Okay, well that's that's cool. We'll loot them and we'll move on to the next thing, and then we'll try to kill all the kobolds. But if you fail in that well shit what happened does somebody get left behind does somebody die do you have to run away you have to come back with the town guard do you you know did they have a hobgoblin that you didn't see you know the, there's always well, something you're talking about more... combat though i mean yeah absolutely well, in combat, in combat yeah. failure is well, always interesting yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 well even to take to to take the concept of 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 the ands and buts you you take it that step further as well so you you beat the goblins Right, you clear out the cave. Nothing else. Add at that point, you add an and or a but to it, mm -hmm. and you know you discover that the goblins were protecting this blah 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 blah. Exactly. Or, but the goblins were actually keeping at bay this other thing that now infects the air, like. So right, just, and the and just the putting it in, yeah. doesn't have to be specifically related to the the whatever the thing was that you did. Like right, you you swung with your sword and you get an and. Well, we could take that as doing two points of damage instead of one point, or we could take it as you know, and uh, you happen to catch a glint of sunlight off the blade of your sword, and it uh, illuminates the corner of the room where you notice another person you hadn't seen before. Right. Has nothing to do with the act of hitting the dude in front of you, but it reveals something else. Um, mm -hmm. There's no reason the and or but has to be like so hyper focused on the thing. So that again, anything that gives you narrative potential is always going to mm -hmm. be good, and that's why uh, if you look at the list of possibilities uh, in the Day Trippers Action Resolution Table, the only thing you won't find is the word no all by itself. Right. There's a yes all by itself. That happens if you if you hit the number exactly. You get yes. That's you just you just you exactly it. managed to do what mm -hmm. you were aiming to do. But that actually is pretty rare. You usually overshoot right. or undershoot because well, they're because both more interesting. No, yeah, they're yeah. both more interesting. Yeah, they inject it, two it pieces moves, of information yes, instead it, of one. Right. I mean, yes by itself, at the very least, at least yes still advances things. Right. But. So a, a just plain yes, you continue on. A plain no is an immediate stop. Mm -hmm. Nothing happens. Yeah, it's not interesting. And that's possibly the most boring. Okay, put it this way. I, I'm saying interesting, but perhaps I'm, I'm using the wrong word or using it in a very specific sense. Because what I really mean is, when I say that a no is not interesting, what I really mean is a no gives us nothing to work on. Exactly, yeah. It's non-productive. It's non-generative. Yeah. It's an every end. every other yeah. possibility is generative of something. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Gonna take a short break. Yeah. All right. <laughs>
And it's funny, I, I came to to role playing a little bit later as well. I was not not quite as late as you, but I was early twenties before I started playing. I you know, I knew what it was, but had never, you know, really had the opportunity. Um and you know, played for a couple of years and it was mechanical. He was like, Oh, you've never played before, you need to play. Eh, cool, whatever. So we played mm-hmm. for a little while. And the group fell apart as groups often do and, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, got out of it. And then when I met Vince and then, you know, we, he was like, Oh, have you ever played? Oh, I've I've been running forever, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, Hey, we, I haven't played in a long time. You know, let's, let's do it. And, you know, when, when jump back into second edition, then, you know, five, six years later, I'm like, what the fuck (laughs) is this armor class here? Like this (laughs) is so fucking stupid. And, you know, it just it didn't really get anywhere. And when fourth came out and he was like, ah, oh, so what do you think? And I'm like, I don't know. Let's get one book and see what happens. And mm. then, you know, like Watsy did their their um, their podcast with Mike Merles and, and Perkins and, you know, had the, the Penny Arcade guys. And it like opened up a whole other world. And it's just been like fucking gangbusters since then. And, I you know, mm-hmm. I think even – you know, as much as I like fourth, fourth was super mechanical. And I think we played a lot that way and you could role play in fourth if you really wanted to, but but the more I've played, the longer I've played, the more the story has really come more to the forefront. Like I said, you know, we, we play and don't roll. (laughs) Yeah. And even when I play, I, I started my D and D career or my, my RPG career period in third edition. It's like the, and it was the tail end of third, like the cusp of Pathfinder mm-hmm. with, you know, dozens of splat books. You talk like if you if you want to talk about crunch in fourth edition, the end of third was insane because there were rules that they set up that, that they broke in other in other supplements. And it was horrible. And but we created stories with that mostly because we didn't pay attention to the rules no. <laughs> like we just forgot about the rules we made our own shit up we simplified the system in us by ourselves i always saw and the I... rules as something sort of free floating um mm-hmm. you tell the story until you need to go to page 84 and then you go right. to page 84 and you do whatever and then you get back to telling the story so the story is yep. like the ocean and the rules pop up like little islands going you need to roll this right now and then submerge again <laughs> <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. I think one of the one of the best things as uh, as designers that a few of the people at D and D did was very much try to tell you, and I think it's something that you really exemplify as well, Todd. Is that the rules are guidelines? Like they're not things you you can use them. They're there for you if you need to make a decision, if you need to figure stuff out they're there for you but you don't need them well yeah you don't need them but honestly when um i try to be the system whatever system i'm running i try to embody the spirit of it so if i'm running if i'm running a trad game then i will endeavor to use all the sub systems uh and i will require all the roles and Mm-hmm. All, all the math and all that shit. Um, when I come across a situation that the rules don't handle, I have to wing it. And of course I have a lot of experience winging it and making shit mm-hmm. up on the spot. So I don't find that hard, but I try to wing it in a way that I imagine the designer would. Oh yeah. If they had written this into their game. And that's something that I, 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 I mean, I've run so many games um, and I try as much as possible to give players the flavor that this designer wanted for this game. Mm-hmm. So I try to take my personal style out of it as, as much as possible. Guess what the, what the system designer was intending. Um, so I agree with you when you say the rules are, are mere guidelines. Um, but when it comes down to practice, I try to stick to the rules of whatever game I'm playing and be the system when it comes to design, however, what I decided was to simply take that the rules are merely guidelines mm-hmm. and mechanize that statement itself <laughs> into the rule. 
Right. Right. Because you're not going to get a uh, five hits of damage or a uh, minor category, this or that. No, you're going to get a yes and, and you get to figure out what it means. Mm -hmm. Right. So the rule returns a guideline. Right. Which I think is a lot, uh, it's just a lot faster, a lot more generative. Um, I am not, and, and I'm not going to shit on simulationists. I was one for a long fucking time. My D&D campaign went for 11 years. Um, I still occasionally enjoy playing a trad game once in a while. Uh, and I wouldn't mind writing for one again. I got no problem with it theoretically, but um, time is limited. And I'm more driven by the emotional stuff. And so mm -hmm. my personal trajectory has always been as much as possible to simplify the system and produce more narrative potential. That's the goal of the system to produce more narrative potential. Hmm. I think that's, that comes with experience as well. When you're, when you're young or not even necessarily young, <clears throat> but when you're, when you're inexperienced, you can you can be inexperienced when you're five, and you can be inexperienced with your when you're fifty. It, I don't think that I don't think that time necessarily means experience. But when you're inexperienced, it it's hard for you to to branch out in the way that narrativism matters. I think. Right. When that we were playing D&D &D back then, is more important. We, would, we would stick very close to the rules. Right. Uh, we used every chart, every table, every book. I ran. Uh, I started with white box, but soon got first edition. So most of the mm -hmm. stuff I ran was first edition. Then the second edition books started coming out. I supplemented with select, like the Monster Compendium. I like that one. Uh, most of the stuff that, you know, like Player's Handbook. I already have Player's Handbook 1. I don't need Player's Handbook 2, that kind of shit. Um, and what we found then was that the story happens retroactively. That's the way life hits you, right? You go through a series right. of what seems like unrelated events, but then I've gone through a couple of years, you stop and you look back and you go, hey, that was like a little narrative arc that taught me a lesson. Right? You realize the story afterward. That's the right. way we played before. Yep. When you're a simulationist, the, the story comes afterward when you're looking back at it. Mm -hmm. When you're a narrative, narrativist, the story's happening right now. Right. And I think that we, you know, with with experience in in gaming and in life, you're more interested in being in the moment and telling the story and evolving it now. You want you want to you are enveloping yourself yourself in the story in the moment rather than putting the importance on the simulation of life to then look at look back at it later. Right. And the other reason is because, you know, like for me anyways, the feelings are the most important part. So let's just right. get get everything out of the way that doesn't that doesn't hit you in the feels or give me the, an opportunity to hit you mm -hmm. in the feels or right. give you an opportunity to project because that's important too. This is a two-way thing, mm -hmm. right? I need to give you plenty of opportunities to unload psychic content for me to notice it in the first place. And right. then my art is working it back in in some interesting way. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think if we could get over the hump of RPGs being nerd, <laughs> like there's, you know, there's still just a, if you, even though RPGs in general, not just D&D, &D, but RPGs and tabletop games in general are the possible, are, are the most popular now than they have been right. but still a super small subsect of the population plays them I, I gotta tell you i mean although it would be nice to to make a living off of role-playing games which is almost impossible to do oh yeah i mean even vincent baker doesn't has a day job yeah right? and apocalypse world is like the most popular indie game ever probably except maybe fiasco i mean one of those two but neither of those yeah. Neither of those gentlemen can live off the earnings of that game. Which is, right. Exactly. Not enough. Yeah. Uh, and part of it's the nature of the of the system too, right? So, like something like Fiasco, 
you know, you buy one book for, you know, if you have a regular group of four five, six people, everybody doesn't necessarily need a book. Right. I mean, it, right. it just, it's, it's part of, you know, if you're playing D and D, maybe everybody has a player's guide, but you've got one monster manual and one, you know, GM's guide or one. Right. It's an interesting art form in that it really only sells its product to one out of four or five. Of its, <laughs> right. Yeah. That, that's right. always the GM always carries the, the financial burden there. Yeah. Um, but, but even, the point but is that even though it would be great to, to make a living off of playing role playing games, on the other hand, I I have a problem with the sort of mainstreaming of geek culture. First off, oh, geek yeah. culture is not monolithic. I don't give a fuck about Star Wars. Um, <laughs> I don't read comic books. Right. You know, I, I that's I I find it demeaning and ridiculous and and mm -hmm. like so I want to say some word kind of like racist. Like it's it's clumping people together in a way that observes them as a monolith when they're not a monolith right um so so in that sense i kind of enjoy being the weird cousin of board games <laughs> right <laughs> yeah i mean no. it, good no i just my my problem with it is that i it's not necessarily all right it's not necessarily that i want role-playing games to be main mainstream you know i don't want them to be popularized in the fact that like it it becomes a a cliche type thing like like comic like you know like comic books have now you know where the mm -hmm. where the you know the investment the 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 soul of it is ripped out Right. Yeah. Oh, the you know, that's the important part. That's the you know right. again the submerged iceberg analogy, right? The fact right. that role playing games are one thing and interactive theater is another, and branching interactive mm -hmm. fiction is a third, and CD ROM adventure games is a fourth, and open ended um, procedural simulations like No Man's Sky is is a fifth. There is a character in there. You're sort of playing a character a little bit, and it's a mm -hmm. big huge lonely game you're a tiny little thing in this gigantic fucking universe all right. of these are actually connected by that same undersurface of wishing mm -hmm. to step into an interactive simulation of something of some kind so it's not about yep. role-playing games role-playing game is just just one way in which this human creative urge mm -hmm. shows itself rather than saying i would like role-playing games to be more mainstream i would right, say right. I hope that more people, in fact, I hope that all people eventually, I hope it becomes normal for people to engage in immersive, collaborative, narrative experiences. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't want to put any, any more you know, specific mm -hmm. of a class on it than that. Because exactly. who knows what games are going to be invented tomorrow. But there are so many benefits. The, uh, the ability to expand your empathy by sinking into another person's shoes, the ability to step outside yourself and look at yourself from outside. You may have therapeutic psychological benefits. Uh, the sheer just fucking fun of making up shit with a, a group of friends. And mm -hmm. the fact that it teaches that it teaches this is a democratic process. This is a living, breathing. There's so many ways in which these experiences are are beneficial and should be experienced by everyone. We should consider it a normal mm -hmm. part of life, extending not just through childhood when you play make-believe, but into the adult years. The idea of immersively interacting with a gestalt would open all of us up. We would all be right. so much more flexible exactly. and relaxed as a society. Yep. Uh, if we all went to more interactive theater shows, if we all yep. read more branching fiction, if we all played more role-playing games, all of these things feed into this broadening of, of human potential and narrative mm -hmm. uh, meaning, which is what we're really right. doing this for. We're trying to make meaning out of shit. Yep. I really wish that that people who who played fantasy football realized mm -hmm. that there's mm -hmm. not a lot of difference between what you do immersing yourself into that universe that's not oh, yeah. real it's not re it is fantasy yeah. you were creating that story of that season of football well you, you may do... even have you may even have a, a quote-unquote character 
who you exactly. quote unquote play. Like yeah. this year, this they year do. I'm going to you are real they are Boston, yeah. who's like constantly yep. putting down the other team. Or this year I'm going to try put all of my eggs into this one, the best kicker in the whole fucking league. Yeah. Or whatever. And that's like that's a dude you made up. You're yeah. actually playing. Well, what they, yeah, they are. They have made up the coach of the team. Yeah. They have they have created a character that is a coach of a fantasy team. It might be real people that you are taking in, people who have stats that are generated by a system. There is n- almost the only difference between what you do and what I do is the system that we use. Pretty much. And yeah, if people can much. realize that. In my friend and I used to, I had a roommate I lived with for several years back in my early 20s. Uh, we were both totally into uh, role playing. And was, this was before there was a need to idea of story games, but we were always mm. turning shit into games that wasn't actually a game. And one of the things that we loved to do was add a level of role play on top of some other game. Like yeah. we would play, um, oh, Squad Commander, I think was the game. That was a that was a really good one. Where we would, you know, you've got these little guys on the board. You're controlling just a squad. It's not a huge uh, military simulation. It's a very tight, focused urban warfare simulation where you're you're the squad and and the other guy is the enemy squad, right? So you've got like you know twelve guys and and a, a backup unit, and so you can call in artillery. Uh, and that's about it, right? And we would give all these guys names and backstories. Make these two guys are best friends, and these two guys hate each other, and and, and give them lines of dialogue as we were fucking running around the board. So we're playing two games at once. It's fucking awesome. Mm-hmm. My brother and I did that with BattleTech too, not not <laughs> consistently throughout like a big campaign because we would set up you know huge. I had a you know eight foot of, of plywood all hexed out and everything. We'd set up huge thing and. You know, we get a bunch of squads, but all the dudes were named. And, you know, as, as we would go through stuff, we would kind and of. And when they the die, you feel it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. like, oh, no, Johnson. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, to, and it's, go, it's, it's, he's never yeah. going to have a chance to see his baby right. boy. <laughs> all right. It's re- but it's, it's really sad because the people who refuse themselves this are are really limiting themselves like and like the i hands down i know the reason that so many people don't come over because i've run into this and i have friends who have run into this is that what you do is manly it's macho what you do (laughs) is masculine and what i do is weak it's make-believe it's it's geek it's nerd it's dork it's it's fake mm-hmm. I, I was to make they, they refuse to cross that line there's yeah. some people and but they they, they don't realize that what you're doing is fake too. there are there are too many people because i believe they're the majority whose only publicly expressible emotions are related to their score Yep. In the real world, their score is their bank account. Mm-hmm. In the fantasy football league, their score is, you know, literally their score. And that seems to be all they wish to get emotional about. Mm-hmm. Like every other emotion is, uh, we don't want to go there. Yeah. Well, it, 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 re- it requires a, a certain amount of, of, of openness. I can't think of the fucking word I had a minute ago. Um, vulnerability mm-hmm. to be able to 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 do what we do, right? Like, so you know, you can get kids to do it because kids. Do you think care. that's true? Even no if you're basically playing yourself and literally imagining yourself in the situation, so. because, because I think that's even more because you're putting, you're allowing yourself to open up to a different level than you even if you wouldn't even if you wouldn't normally express yourself that way in real in in real well, life what i'm trying to remove the, is what i'm trying to remove is anything that they might find gay lame objectionable weak mm-hmm. whatever right so remove the acting 
uh, re remove remove all of the emotion except the victory of uh, you know the, the feeling of success or failure. Yeah, turn it into merely a mechanical simulation. I mean, start somewhere. You start with that. There was a game, a really bad game, worst game I've, I've ever read, and I actually tried running it. It was almost impossible. And it was called Time Ship, and it came out in the late 80s. It was a real piece of crap. But one thing that was cool about it was the first game I ever saw where you literally played you. Mm. Mm. Right, I, uh, and yeah. that, their, their approach, their attempt was, was that, you know, look, we're going to be throwing you into so many unusual situations. We want to make the cognitive overhead easy for you. We're just going to have you rather than bank on your ability to project into a fictional persona, we're just going to say it's you. Do you, do you not agree? Do you think that's, that doesn't actually make things easier? Sounds like. I, I think, well, and I don't know, maybe I can only speak for the way that we play, right? Not, not speaking for everybody that plays role-playing games. And especially for day trippers, because it's a real bleedy game. It's also a very vulnerable game. Oh, uh, absolutely. Is, well, know, I think a lot of that. I, I, I would not giving, recommend day trippers yeah. as the first game for a fantasy football. League yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. I th yeah, I think, I think in, it, all right, it can happen one of, so I think as an introductory aspect, just playing yourself is probably the easiest way to get somebody into the concept and theory of role play because they don't have to put on the falsitude of being a character. Yeah. So they like don't you have said, to know is... anything about elves or whatever. Exactly. Right. Or even if you're playing a, a, a regular person, even if you're playing a human there's still, I think there's still that boundary of acting right. that is, that can be perceived as weak. Right. I think there's two performative boundaries in, in role play and not surprising. They are about acting and about writing. No. Right. Cause some people think that acting is that's too vulnerable or, or it's lame um, somehow. Uh, the other thing is, even people who are willing to do the acting part, sometimes when you're playing a game that involves a lot of back and forth, they look at you like, you know, deer caught in the headlights. I can't think of anything. Oh, all you guys are so clever, and I'm just stupid. I, I don't have any ideas. You get that sometimes. Right. Like, I'm not a writer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you guys have been doing this for a while. I don't, I don't, I don't have any ideas. Um, I, I think to, to, I wasn't thinking about it maybe the way that you were thinking about it to bring someone in. Yeah. I think maybe superficially to play yourself would be the easy in, because I think in an introductory game where you're just sort of playing yourself doing a thing, um, you know, maybe like a zombie themed, whatever. Cause that's, you know, it's huge, right? Everybody's into this. Oh, I, I'd, I'd be great at that. I'd kill all the zombies, whatever. There's, there's not, a an internal view down to be like, well, what is, you know, I'm playing this, you know, I'm playing myself. And then, you know, the, that character does something. There's no like, well, geez, what I, why, why did I say that? I don't, I wouldn't really do that. Like there's no <laughs> introspective part of like, okay, we're just killing zombies. Unlike, you know, how we play all of our games. There is a lot of internal, stuff yeah. that goes on and, and not all of it, you know, necessarily, but like, yeah, but again, actually, I think that was a great, that was a great example. Um, I, I might go so far as to say it's, it's, it's definitely at the, at the top of the short list, uh, for introducing people to role play who may come from the fantasy football universe or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, would be a modern day zombie attack. That's a great, it's almost completely tactical. And it's part of and yet, if you want to get emotional with it, you can. You know, you can be the save the babies guy, mm -hmm. um, or you can just be the the sniper picking off fucking zombies from the rooftop. Right. Um, and it start. It's a very little overhead because it's modern world. You're playing mm -hmm. you. Everything available is available. Right. I think that's actually a great scenario. It, it like for first first time role players. Yeah, start them off with the zombie campaign where they play themselves. I think that's great. And you know what would be great about it too is 
just like so way back in the beginning uh talking about you know bringing the absurd into storytelling to subvert ideas doing it in 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 that kind of zombie apocalypse as situation you are playing yourself you are in an absurd situation that clearly will never happen but you know similar to like walking dead and and night of the living dead and things like that you're able to throw in ideas that you've seen that, before that you've seen before and challenges to those people who they are playing themselves but it's a different reality so they can face things and ideas that they haven't faced in real life before and think about it in an alternate fashion it's not them making the decision it's them but it's them over here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so they're faced with all these challenges and faced with these ideas but they don't have to deal with the consequences of it it's it's their other them thinking about it and dealing with it but obviously that's going to bleed in that's going to same way i know for a fact that we've talked about this before john that decisions that you've made with nash bleed it like that's just the concept of rpgs mm -hmm. right as we've talked before your character is you there's very there we might think that there's a huge separation but there's not he, it's still he's the part. truest so, me <laughs> right yeah, if i so, if i succeed so concepts in making, that, yeah if i succeed in making your character feel anything then clearly i've succeeded in making you feel it exactly mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so there's there's that that wall, that membrane in between your character and you is not nearly as thick as we initially think it is. Mm -hmm. So yeah. constant so problems and issues that you deal with in the game world will bleed over and change you in the real world, no matter what they are. I mean, we we've had full stop in games where John and I just were both like this is fucking bull. I'm angry right now because this is bullshit. <laughs> Give me a minute. Wait a minute. We get are back we, on track. Are we talking about contingency plan B? Well, not only contingency that that whole thing with Drear with with Blanche, you know, right from the jump, like it and it's like John and I, but I'm getting aggravated right now. <laughs> just talking about it. But John and I had like both like full stop in the middle of the game, like. No, I, I get Todd. I get what you're saying. I fully understand what Bento was saying. Like, I get it intellectually. I understand it, but this is fucking bullshit. I fucking hate this bitch. <laughs> I hate this bitch. Because it's the same kind of shit you deal with in, in your, you know, your regular work day. You know, the boss says this, the other boss says that. You're trying to do this thing here. Like, get the fuck away from me and let me do my job. Just shut up. <laughs> no, that's what that's why I think that I I I was saying before, I wish so many more people realize that there's really no difference in what they do than what we do, because hopefully then they would start doing more of what we do. And I think that would open up everybody to just a whole new level of understanding. Because, mm -hmm. like, yeah. no matter, I, I've never. It's very, and you know what? And it's a it's a game. If you, we we let them know, it's a game, right? Because mm -hmm. what they might be scared of is that you're going to do that. I'm I'm a group therapist, and we're going to do a feely, touchy group thing, right? No, I'm not joining hands and singing kumbaya. That's gay, right? Fuck that shit. No, no, no. It's a game. It's a game. We're going to kill zombies. Yep. How can you exactly? You know. That's not joining hands and singing kumbaya. So yeah, you can relax. Right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, all the bleed comes later after after you get them hooked. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Like you know, remember that zombie game where you were the fucking hero? Well, we're doing one next week where we're investigators in 1920 looking into the Cthulhu mythos. You in? 
<laughs> you might get a yes this time when you wouldn't have before. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I, 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 I still feel like it is a pretty big hurdle, like Jesse said. It's, it's not only that sort of machismo of, like, that's stupid, why I'm not going to do that, like, you know, mm -hmm. forget it, let's go shoot guns or whatever. Well, you know, I, I shoot guns, I go to the gym, I, you know, play role-playing games. Like, I, right. they're not a mutually exclusive thing, but the, but there is that that level, and then I think there's also the level of vulnerability, and there's also the level of, like, I don't want to look stupid. You know, mm -hmm. like, I don't, yeah. like, I, I, I can't do that. You know, I don't want to do that. I, I, you know, because it may open up something that maybe, and I, I don't think that people think about it at that level, but, you know, there is that like, oh, you know, you, you play that game and it, and it hits a certain note. Like maybe you didn't know you had, uh, you know, an aversion to this thing or, you know, this, you know, traumatic childhood memory that you hadn't thought of in, in forever. Mm -hmm. And you're in the zombie game and the dog dies. And then you remember when you're, you know, your dog got hit by a car and like, I, then it turns into like a whole thing. And, you know, I'm thinking of that scene from community where the, the Dean orders a, a dancer and the dancer comes and he's like a, a man dressed in a big furry suit. He's like a, a Dalmatian or something. And the Dean is like stroking his fur. He's going, this better not awaken anything in me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like, I was, uh, uh, I was told, so to, to bring it into a, 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 a recent example, not this doesn't have anything to do with games, but going off what we were talking about, uh, I was told in a I'm going to call it a conversation for whatever that means. It was on the Internet. So as much as a conversation you can have with a stranger who is being super defensive. So you're just uh, screaming at somebody. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep. As I usually do. Um, <laughs> and I, you know, I was told because I was attempting to show empathy towards people. I was told to harden up. Oh, I saw this. this is what you tweeted yesterday. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Reply yeah. I was so, because because I was attempting to have some type of connection with another person. I was told to harden to man up. And that well, that's is the, the default, hurdle. right? That's the hurdle we're trying yeah. to get over. Yeah. Right. Those people, <laughs> those people who only feel emotions related to their score, they think it's a dog eat dog world. Exactly. Uh, and that's just the nature of it. So fucking yep. get out there and bite another dog. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. He actually, this guy literally told me that, uh, that, and it's, it's really sad. And I, I, Feel for I know Which, where. By the way, has from, anyone man. ever seen a dog eating another dog? I just want to know because <laughs> <laughs> I haven't. <laughs> but Not it's like, uh, no. But it's uh, where? What was I saying? I can't remember. You felt bad for the guy because you knew where he was coming from. Oh yeah, because he said he said that um, that uh, when I, I was talking about uh, the you know concepts of liberalism and social like small small lowercase mm -hmm. and and i was saying how you know the, the the point of a lot of it is to is is to help the society to help the people around you and he said i what i want to help people but i don't believe the people around me would help me mm hmm and i was like that's and that's going exactly into what you said it's a doggy dog I need to get what I want. So I need to fight the people around me for it. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. that's not how it has to be. <laughs> for sure. It doesn't. But right. But, but this is what it comes back to. I've had, I don't know if we've had this conversation, but I had this conversation mm -hmm. with a couple of people because you know, you know, it, it's, it's in our DNA as, as Americans, you know, quote unquote, you know, we founded the country in revolution and thumbed our nose at the British and, and all this stuff and, and, you know, this idea of rugged individualism and it's almost like a whiplash when, you know, they say, oh, you know, let's, let's, you know, let's help other people out. Let's, you know, bring up this, you know, you know, socialism, bad socialism. 
you know, it's like, well, I did it. You could do it. Like it's, a, it's just, it's sort of almost like, yeah, but a, a, it's red. not because times have changed. Things no, no, are I know, different. I know. The 1% oh, is, yeah. you know, richer yeah, no, than no, ever, sure. et cetera, et cetera. But, but what I'm saying is I think like the knee jerk because of the way, not the way we've been raised like by our parents, but no, like, you're right. But, the right. but on top of that, the knee jerk is even worse than what you're suggesting because the average American is not, a rugged individualist. The average right. American is an overweight, opioid yeah, addicted, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> headline repeating moron right. mm -hmm. who thinks of himself as a rugged individualist, yep. but couldn't survive one week in quarantine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I gotta get my hair cut. <laughs> right. Oh yeah, there's no, so I, many, I agree. There, I agree. there are so many people out there. So it's even worse. Have, you know, it's even worse because it's, yeah. it's not rugged individualism you're fighting against. It's the idea of rugged individualism. Right. It's actually a neurosis. Yeah. yeah. Right. There's so many people out there who would tell, you know, if the, you know, the only reason you're poor is because you don't try enough. You need to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and get done. You didn't. I want to know. <laughs> like you were here, you were handed these things from your, your parents made it easy for you to I get into college and to do this. I'm not saying you two, like, but into, I want to like, know this. how Mark Zuckerberg would have become rich if thousands of people hadn't spent their lives laying down, oh, electrical grids and roads to get to his fucking shiny new office building, right. which he didn't build himself. The whole history of the city in which his building exists is made of the contributions of thousands of people mm -hmm. who he deems way below out, him on the social yeah. ladder. Look at he the the if he had not gone to Harvard to do that, he never would have been. How did he get into Harvard? His parents weren't poor. Yeah. You know, they looked at who his parents were and their place in life and said you can afford to go here. We believe that you will be able to pay your bills in the future. Yeah. We will well, just like away. just like Trump says. The reason anybody, that he had the grades he had is America, because he you know? went to a good if school and was able if to your afford dad gives you a million. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, the whole deck is stacked against you from from the beginning, right? Like so we're all middle class ish, right? But well, the point I'm trying to raise here is that it's already a social network before Zuckerberg mm -hmm. writes the first line of code. He's already taking advantage exactly. yeah. of a gigantic network of labor that's been laid down by thousands of people for hundreds of years. Yep. Oh yeah. It's funny when, you know, in a, in a, in a discussion, I was, dis I was, I, I was called a liberal socialist, socialist commie by a person. <laughs> and, uh, before well, getting that, that I was clearly an idiot because you actually can't be all three of those things. So <laughs> exactly, exactly. But, uh, but I, I tried to explain to him in, 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 in lowercase terms, what, what being liberal is, what being socialist is. And I describe it's like, it's, you know, it's about being accepting new knowledge about evolving yourself in terms of being liberal to be not be stagnant and to be socialist in, in terms of just a very bare concept is about your society. It's about the people around you. It's about, I, I equated it to co-ops. I think your like, first about definition sharing. was closer to the word progressive. Progressive. Well, yes. Yeah. And the, no, problem no, with the, word, word too. the problem with the word liberal is that it, <laughs> it has, it has two meanings because you can be it does fiscally liberal or socially liberal, and what yeah. they're usually pointing you out when they call you a pinko is that you you think gays can get married and trans women are women or something like that. You're right. Um, yeah. But when they say liberal, like neoliberal, they what they mean is the government keeps its hands away from business transactions. Right. Liberal right. with money. Yes. So that's a word you got to kind of qualify, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, very true. But then, but, you know, I, in talking, I, you know, we then, we broke down the foundation of our government, the foundation of our constitution and why it was written. It was written by people who wanted better, who wanted to evolve past. They, they did not want to create a government that they came from.
They wanted to create a better government. They wanted to move it to evolve things. Mm -hmm. They wanted to they they wanted to protect the people from the government. But in doing so, they they put heavy well, they bases. To protect the white male landowning people. Well, very but, yeah. yes, <laughs> it's very true. There was a reason that that they that they uh, substituted John Locke's. Uh, uh, was it the um, they 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 stripped out property for for uh for freedom? No, what uh, was it? Uh, happiness. So John Locke was life, liberty, and in property. Oh, they changed okay. it to life, liberty, in the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> yeah, you can drop a rat into a maze of broken glass and and <laughs> burning flames and say, "Okay, pursue happiness." Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that's why that was their that was their thing is that they wanted to make property a very specific thing that only a handful of white males could could own. Hmm. So instead, they said, "Well, anybody can pursue happiness. Though you can be a slave." Yeah, be owned by another person, but you could still pursue happiness. Yeah, I mean, eating, but, eating is an act of pursuing happiness. So as long as you exactly. eat, you know, but getting up to yeah, go to the bathroom, but, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but in but in in general terms, it was founded on the it it was uh, to keep the government from stepping on anybody's toes. You know, that's what the you know the 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 first and second amendment are. The third amendment is to keep. The, the the third fourth and fifth amendment is to keep the uh keep the police away from you keep the military away from you and make sure that they can't infringe on you and then you eventually come down to the 10th which is your community your society your state eventually has control ultimate control over whatever happens mm -hmm. and it was supposed to be small groups of people societies mm -hmm. Who could control themselves to evolve to a better place? That is progressive socialism, like small well, yeah, parts. In a way, I mean, yeah. if you go back early enough into the earliest days of America, uh, you could say it verges on anarcho syndicalism. Yeah, each each town is basically a a commune that works to preserve their own wealth and the wealth of their local neighbors mm -hmm. and does dealings with the town down the river mm -hmm. in pursuit of, of uh, prospects for both. Right. Um, but each has its own culture, maybe its own dialect, maybe its own religion. They're very different from each other. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you know, you even, you even take the, the, if you go into, uh, you know, taking out the, the, the war aspect, the revolutionary aspect of Leninism, you know, the ultimate, the, 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 the small idea goal of communism is, is of the community. It's everything is shared within a community and, you know, people, it, the problem is that it doesn't trans, it doesn't transfer to a large government at all, or, or and, but really you know, people, modernism yeah. like we have. Right. I mean, yeah, the, the, yeah, the so big the, problem the, with communism is about is a structural design. The internet has taught us a lot, and I generally feel that mm -hmm. the people who who put together the the core internet protocols and the uh, distributed uh, network that we all take advantage of would be much better at writing laws than the people who, who actually write them. <laughs> right. Almost because, anybody would be better. <laughs> okay, because the core lessons <laughs> right. of the internet involve things like de decentralization, redundancy, mm -hmm. flexibility. All of yep. these are built into the system. The internet was designed to withstand a nuclear war. If part of the internet shuts down, information just routes around it. Right. Uh, there is no center. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the big problem with communism is there is a center. Exactly. And that center inevitably becomes corrupt. Yes. Because people have the people. I mean, that, that's the problem. <laughs> right. I, I mean, mean only a percentage the, of the funny them. thing. Yeah. The funny thing is, is that people think that's just a communist thing. That happens. Look at our government. No, sure. Even with, even with a multiple party system, mm -hmm. the people in power create the rules to keep themselves in power. 
vote their own raises, you know, right. all that yep. stuff. Yeah. Right. So even though, and you know, I, that's one thing I was trying to get across to a, to a couple of people the other day. It's like, I'm, I am not either side. I don't like Democrats or Republicans. I think we could say as like, a because general they rule are, that decentralization yeah. is always better. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, I'm not allow, sure it doesn't allow. I'm not sure that those other people would agree, right? Isn't there something about the uh, the right wing mindset that responds positively to authority? This is why mm-hmm. right right fascism looms its head over there because they yeah. literally yeah. see life as a a hierarchy. Yeah. See, but but yeah. that and authority that doesn't affect you though, right? Like that that's the thing though, right? So you have that like respect authority unless I got to go get a haircut. But oh, they're they're murdering you. Uh, just go back inside, like go sit down. It's fine. Don't you know what it? You know what it is? It is the person driving. You know, because ninety five percent of the time it always is the the guy driving the pickup truck uh-huh. that has the thin blue line sticker on one side yeah. and the "Don't Tread on Me" sticker on the other. Yeah, they they have the veil that they are anti authority. But ultimately, that they have, that is what they have gotten all their power from. That is what they have gotten their living from. That is where their their place resides, in the authorities keeping their tribe, their sect in power. Mm-hmm. So they are allowed right. to and say they are anti-authority because they don't have to are, worry about the authorities. They're isolationists within the nation. But they call themselves nationalists. Yeah. yeah. That's weird. Yep. You know, they, they'll they talk to you all day long about patriotism and the great American nation. But how can you actually be a nationalist in a multicultural nation if you only admit rights to one culture? Mm-hmm. Well, it's because the the words the I mean, first of all, the word patriotism has gotten severely perversed over the last few decades. Like, if you think who the very first patriots that we to to be a patriot nowadays is to be for your government, no matter what, mm-hmm. right? But who were the I'm very first the patriots that are? Yeah. Because it sounds to me like patriot shares a root with paternal. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's a big daddy thing. <laughs> yeah, but it's like look at our very the very you know our the first patriots that we had you know patriots in this area existed before we even had a country. Before there was any really organization, before you know it was when it was an idea. So how can you? How can being a patriot be supporting your country when the concept of page of American patriotism occurred before there was even in America. Well, it would be nice to get back to even that level. I mean, what that I mean, before there was an America, but you could still be a patriot. What was that? That was a shared community, uh, sense of value and, and belonging mm-hmm. purpose and protection. Right. Yep. And it was easier to do because we had a common enemy in the British. Right. So but if you're over really here and, and you believe that these colonies should be free, I don't care where you came from. Yeah. But, I, but it, and that, that's certainly a part of it, right? But like, how many people go outside and talk to their neighbors now? Like, you know, do you know all the neighbors on your street? And I'm sure some yeah, people do. do, right? <laughs> but but I think by and large, a lot of people don't do that. There isn't mm-hmm. a sense of community because you have, you know, the internet and you have your phone and people are, you know, mired in work and, you know, they're watching their favorite TV shows or whatever. And there isn't a sense of community, especially in the suburbs. It's, it's a lot less. There isn't even a sense of outside, really, because everything you see about the rest of the world comes to you on television. Like when I was a kid, I thought places like India and Africa were like movie sets where Disney engineers (laughs) created a fictional reality. I didn't know that they were real. You couldn't prove to me that they were actually real places. Uh, We've become so uh, mesmerized by the culture that surrounds us. Every one of us is surrounded by a 360-degree bubble 24-7. 
-hmm. and forget that the rest of the world is actually even fucking real. And so instead, we started looking for enemies within. Mm -hmm. Right? Instead of saying, well, well you're, you're a red coat. Uh, you want me and my fellows over there in Virginia and my fellows down there. And, you know, you want us all to live under your rule, taxation, without, blah, 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 we will unite against you. But as soon as that problem is taken care of, oh, now there's an insidious threat and it threatens our republic. And where's it coming from? It's coming from in the house. <laughs> and so uh, I, I, I somewhat resent not resent, but I, I, I disagree with the the uh, the threat of the internet in that respect of like create of because when I was growing up, my parents had no idea who my neighbors were, and my neighbors had no idea who who we were. Mm -hmm. They didn't talk at all. This was in the eighties and nineties before like internet real i mean i knew the internet exists but it wasn't popular on my block all the kids <laughs> knew each other but none of the parents did exactly i i mean i uh, i was unfortunate in that there were no kids right around me but like all the kids within a three block radius knew each other yeah yeah but my my parents didn't know anybody and to to the extent where we uh my dad had an old broken down motorcycle in the backyard and we went on vacation for uh, for a week and came back and the motorcycle was in a different place. Huh. My neighbor just, you know, a couple weeks later, uh, just happened to be outside the same time my dad was and said, oh, hey, I saw a couple of kids trying to steal your bike. Huh. Did he did he say anything to kids? No. Did he call the cops? No. <laughs> did he tell my dad? <laughs> anything no he 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 didn't try to go anywhere out of his way <laughs> to do anything for the neighbor that we had lived next to for over a decade not only that <laughs> but when he did see a moment to talk about it he basically treated it as small talk mm -hmm. exactly <laughs> so i think my parents so, growing up they knew everybody around and of course you know the kids you know we you know, we left and then came home at dark or whatever, you know, like it was yeah. a different time then. But I, I, man, I feel like they knew everybody on the street, you know, up and down the street, you know, because it was like, yeah. oh, those people are nice. Or, you know, you call those people Aunt Mary or whatever. And like, yeah. oh, don't go to that house. Those people aren't nice, you know, whatever. They're whatever, you know. So like, I, I remember that sort of stuff, like that went up and down the street. But like, I, I have a couple of neighbors that I talk to, but I, I don't, I don't know everybody. I wave at people outside, but like, we don't have any kind of like block thing. People don't come over. Like it's, it's not, you know, yeah. it's, it's different for yeah. better or worse. <laughs> I think for worse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, because I think it, 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 it gives a separation, you know, our, our, the, in, because it sells this more products, whole... we're scared of each other, <laughs> right? But well, well, because fear, fear keeps fear keeps us in place. Mm -hmm. it's That's why we're, they are. It's the whole true. right. When it's the turn... whole punch down, punch up thing. Yeah. 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 If you're if you're afraid of someone else, then it redirects your anger towards them. I was I was kind of I was I was kind of proud of something that I said to someone the other day and I want to turn it into a bumper sticker or something, <laughs> but, uh, it was, so it, um, you should, it, it, uh, you should never pay attention to who the finger is pointing at. You should always point pay attention to who is pointing the finger. You should, if someone sure. is saying, telling you to hate that person, you shouldn't look at them and start to hate them. You should look at the person and say, why are you telling me to hate this person? Mm -hmm. Well, it keeps everybody And that does not them. happen enough. Yeah. They're all too far. Yeah. All too much. And it's not recently. It's over the last 20, 30 years. Longer than that. All too much. We allow, in general, allow people in power to tell us who to hate 
and who to pay attention to and who the problem is. Yeah, and guess why? Keeps them in power. You know, anything, exactly. anything we can, this is why, I, I mean, right now we're focusing on the black lives, okay? And if we can get the cops to stop killing black people, then then it, all the rest of us will be easier, okay? That's This is triage, <laughs> all right? So, right. Although, although I, I, I understand and agree that all lives matter, it's kind of like um, you've been shot twice. You've been shot in the leg and you've been shot in the stomach. Which wound should we deal with first? <laughs> right. Okay? This is triage. Once mm -hmm. we've taken care of your stomach, the leg will be easy. Right. Right? It's that fucking simple. Well, that's the thing. It's it's not an either or. It's not, well, you know, you know, Black Lives Matter. Well, my life matters too. That's that's not what's being said. It, you know, that's the media. That's the government. It's, oh, you know. Well, yeah. Do you think you would lie there in the street going, you know, my stomach is bleeding. Yeah. Oh, does that mean your leg's not bleeding? Yeah. What yeah. the fuck kind of idiot <laughs> remark is that? Well, I, and I saw a great um, political cartoon, you know, somebody saying Black Lives Matter and, you know, the angry white guy on the side, you know, showed All Lives Matter. And then there's a woman sitting there with the breast cancer, you know, shirt on and, you know, she's got the sign that says, you know, breast cancer awareness and it's all, all cancers matter. matter. Right. So like, <laughs> each one is like, it does, like, it doesn't make sense. Right. Like you objectively look at these other things and go, well, that just sounds fucking stupid. Right. Like. Right. It's it's not an either or. That's not what mm -hmm. it is. And I think there's a, the there's it's it's a layer too. Is that like just like you said Todd, is that currently the worst situation that we are dealing with, the top of the layer, the the top of the tip of the iceberg is is the is getting over it's getting through Black Lives Matter. It's like stopping the you know the unwanted death all that um and then maybe eventually if we are able to deal with that we can deal with what's underneath of yeah. why this is created yeah. you know we can talk about the uh just the inherent the at that point maybe we can start start solving the crime because we realize, okay, well, the crime is created because of poverty and because of drugs. And if you're able to solve the poverty and the drugs, then the crime will go down. Then maybe you don't need as many police. And then we can start. Depends how far, all... you, how far you go. But I mean, personally, <laughs> right. I find capitalism at the bottom. No matter what, no matter what chain oh, of absolutely. human misery you follow, capitalism at the, is at the bottom of it. Oh, Absolutely. Because the the inherent point of capitalism is selfishness. It is ensuring that you get as much as you can at the sacrifice of everyone around you. Right. It was. It's. It. it it's an unfortunate thing that the you know in, industrialism started. We might say, in the simplest sense, that capitalism is a system that supports. Um, not only uh, at its start, but further and further as time goes by, supports the ability of, for personal accumulation of power. Mm -hmm. Personal accumulation of power. That's what capitalism is. You could do yeah. it through technology. You can do it through hiring people. You can do it through buying a bunch of slaves. But whatever you're doing, you're pulling surplus value and hoarding it for yourself mm -hmm. and then using that to either make more money expand increase or change the laws to make it easier for you to make even more money either right. way you're ex you're using your personal power to expand your personal power and that's mm -hmm. really all it comes down to yep yep we live and in it's a at that, it's at the you cannot yeah, have the every person everything. expanding their personal power without regard mm -hmm. for the power of anyone else and let that run indefinitely. It might work for a while when you've got scattered townships all over broadly wilderness area. 
right? But when you've got massive populations, metropolises, and instant communication, that thinking has to mm -hmm. go. It just has yeah. to go. And the well, problem is that it makes it it makes it easier because at that point you're if you are localized, if it is small sections of populations, then what that one person does affects 10, 20, 100 people. Yeah. Right. But with a, the globalization that we're dealing with now. And it's with, escapable. You can pack up and move and get away from exactly. it. Exactly. Right. Back then. But now the, 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 uh, the actions of one person, let's just pull. If we look at Jeff Bezos, his one actions affect tens of thousands of people. Yeah, millions. Mil yeah, just yes. Yeah. Yeah. Where yeah, yeah. Did you, even if you if you, if you expand it, he has tens of thousands of workers underneath mm -hmm. him. But then the actions that he creates, the effect that he has in the economy, then affects hundreds of millions, if yeah. not billions, of people. Right. Right. Yeah. There's no accountability. And you know, there, there are studies that indicate, I think you, I think I, something that you posted, Todd, that, that happiness only goes up so far in relation to the amount of money that you have. So once you hit like a certain point, you're not more happy. I, I think the number was about 120,000 maybe. Exactly. So like, it was, I've read different studies that showed similar findings and the number varies from a hundred K to 175. <laughs> so we can cap it at 175. That basically your happiness goes up as your income goes up mm -hmm. to about somewhere between 100 and 175. After that, your money can go up infinitely. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. not even a word. <laughs> but, your happiness, <laughs> but your happiness does not any longer yep. map map onto your income. I, I saw a great, uh, it was, it's, it, uh, it was uh, for comedic purpose, obviously, but I think it has some real world implication is that, uh, Take all of the, it, w once you make a million dollars, if you are now at a gross of a year of a million dollars, hand that person a medal. The medal says yeah. you won capitalism. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have plenty of money to live off of. And at that point, anything over a million goes back into the system. You feel you get the, you get the satisfaction that you have collected all of the tokens, <laughs> you have collected the oh, yeah. thing. In you fact, collected like as many cookies as you make you are. happy. Let's let's take all the billionaires, give them all an award. You won capitalism. Reset the whole fucking game. <laughs> right. Let's play a different game now. You fucking won. Yay! What yeah. is there? Two hundred and fifty of you, or something? Yay! You right. get a trophy. Yeah. You won capitalism. Now all that money that you have is redistributed equally between everybody. And we're printing new money. The old money is not worth anything up. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Now we're all going back to doubloons. Everyone starts from scratch. <laughs> well, no, uh, we're going to we're going to electronic credits, and everybody starts from their from their uh, UBI fund. <laughs> which, is, well, and, which is based and, on uh, FWF. It's a social yeah. welfare fund. It is your share of the nation. Yeah. And I, th you know, I mean, it's so much a, a cultural thing. I mean, and it, you know, to, to kind of tie it back to what we were talking about with, you know, game theory and game design, art and, and you know, design and, and games and things, there's no value placed on that. I mean, that's why something like Patreon is great because if you, you know, like an artist, if you, are you know super into day trippers? You know Todd's got a, a Patreon, so you can donate money to someone to help them do the thing that they're good at that they want to do. That then gives intangible value back to society. That's that's but true, that's, but it's also just one among many of examples yeah, yeah. where we help yeah. each other horizontally to live through the mess that's placed upon us vertically. Right. Mm -hmm. right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm well, just saying want, it's a little uh, part, but yeah. I was just tying it back. Yeah. yeah. But no, so yeah, you're you're absolutely right. There's no there there's not enough emphasis put on there's so we are at the very beginning. If anybody who thinks that we are, you know, climbing our way back up from an economic downfall is no no. 
We no. are we are at the lip of it. We are about say to say goodbye crash. to normal. We're we're never going yeah. back to what you think of as normal. Right. Mm -hmm. But so there, you know, uh a lot of schools, school a lot of a lot of systems right now are talking about school budgets. And a a school system near me has officially for next year officially canceled it's music, it's art, and it's drama programs. Mm -hmm. Always the first to go. Yep. yep. Those are the only systems that allow for creative thinking, for empathy, and for anything outside of rote memorization. Yeah. And this has mm -hmm. been going on for a while. I was the class of 1980, mm -hmm. and uh, I got out of high school early on a GED. I was emancipated by my parents at 16. But at the time I left high school, I Can was... I, real uh, pause. Oh. You've led an awesome life, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> Continue. Uh, yeah, every once in a while, I'll relate a story to my daughter that she's like never heard before. She's like, oh my God, your life has so many movies in it. <laughs> yeah. We haven't even talked about hitchhiking to hate ashbury What the fuck? <laughs> Um, I was on track to, uh, to graduate as a performing arts major mm. and my brother, uh, is two and a half years younger. So he's three years behind me in school. By the time he came to the same high school or, or by the time he was ready to graduate three years or sometime within the next three years, it was no longer possible to, to be a performing arts major. <laughs> it just wasn't on the fucking list. You, it wasn't yep. done anymore. So you had to be an English major. If yeah. you were interested in acting uh, or I don't know what the band did, but I mean, performing arts was just removed. Yeah. So sometime between 1980 and 1983. When we you know this is neoliberalism in action. That's when it's kicking in. That's under Reagan. Right. Yeah. Yep. But when we came out to Arizona in, in 2012, you know, we, you know, registered the kid at school and everything. And they were all excited that they got music program back again. And it's like, Oh, we haven't had, yeah. you know, this is the first year we've had music. And I'm like, wait, what, <laughs> what? <laughs> what are you yeah. talking about? Like, Oh yeah, we didn't yep. have art. We didn't have music, this and that. And I'm like, fuck, where did we move to? <laughs> like, it's fucking sad. Especially because these days, you know, with, with a automation, uh, and B the, uh, the ever-changing technological landscape, which makes mm -hmm. jobs appear. I don't, you know, I'm a web developer. What didn't exist when I was born. Jobs mm -hmm. appear, and it's already fading, right? If your web developer is already something in the past. No young mm -hmm. kids in high school are thinking, I'm going to have a career as a web developer now. That, mm -hmm. That's off. But for 30 oh, years, because there's, it was Because there's websites thing. that make that make them there's web right. there's there's automated. websites that make websites for you <laughs> right right it's all been automated so and yep. so that's a that's a natural that's a natural progression but it's getting mm -hmm. faster right technology yes. merges yeah. with other technologies and spawns third wave technologies which are mm -hmm. unpredictable unpredictable from right. our standpoint mm -hmm. and that means what the fuck are you to train your kids for mm -hmm. how are you getting right it seems it seems that uh the creative arts is one because they teach you to think in a broad way rather than a focused way exactly. is one of the few types of education that may have some lasting value on a completely unforeseeable job market in the future. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think one of the big problems that we have is that there's the arts are not measurable, right? So it, in math class, Patreon in followers, class, yeah, right. In, <laughs> in math and English and history comes down and everything. To your you online can... metrics. That's where we're yep. going, man. The exactly. The can... society yeah. is based on a reputation economy. Right. Oh, right. Fuck. And the you know, the, the, the issue we're running into right now is that with the prolifer the proliferation of the internet, you know, before history let's say history class. All right, history was about knowing history, right? You don't have to know any history anymore because no. I can just take my phone out and look up a fact. I can look up when a date, when something occurred. Yeah. I can look it up. And the problem is that we have not made the transition. Until the, until it, the EMPs yeah. come. Well, sure, <laughs> yes. So the, so the issue is that what we should be doing is transitioning into 
understanding the concepts of history, understanding understanding why things happen, how they happen, the developmentation of it. But that's not happening. Instead, we're focusing more and more on the test, on the number. I mean, I I don't disagree with you, but like. I'm picturing the the political and philosophical arguments that arise at the, at the moment you say that. Like, okay, so would we teach kids the Hegelian dialectic? <laughs> Are we leading them into French postmodernism? Well, you talk. So, uh, look at uh, the the history of the United States. If you're just going to break it down as super simple, you know, look at what we've been talking about right now. What they talk about is the numbers of when the country was developed. When, when did slavery start? When did this start? When, instead of talking about when and who, talk about how. Why? But you can't measure, you can't measure how. Yeah, you, can't you know put, why? You can't you put know a why? numerical because how value is a narrative. on how. How is a right. narrative. Right. The way we understand things, uh, the way we understand things is by mm-hmm. forming narratives or drawing narrative conclusions from them. Mm-hmm. And here's where we get to do a plug for one of the best TV shows ever made, James Burke's Connections. It was on PBS in the 80s, I believe. And you can find all the episodes he did, Connections 1, 2, and 3. Uh, Each one was somewhere between 12 and 20 episodes. What he does is he takes a single idea, starts at its, uh, its most ancient hint of invention, like... Mm -hmm. You know, when somebody in the Italian Renaissance sketches the first submarine. Um, And then part by part, invention by invention, century by century, he traces it forward until you get to... And usually what's amazing about it is you don't end up at today's submarine. You end up at today's skyscraper or something. Yep. You're like, whoa! Like that whole (laughs) chain of connections... Each inventor, depending on the work of somebody who came before, ends mm-hmm. up in this completely unpredictable place. And that's why we have skyscrapers. Mm-hmm. Fucking amazing series. I totally recommend it. Everyone in the world yep. should watch this show. And he does exactly what you're talking about. You may forget the years. You may forget the names. But you will remember that the ball bearing led to buckshot. <laughs> right. Right. Mm-hmm. I think one of the big problems is that we have forgotten about what came before because we, we forget about that building up period. We forget about, we think when, when you ask a Patriot w- why the country developed, they talk about the forefathers. They talk about the fight against the British. They cannot tell you who, the forefathers stole ideas from they didn't just mm-hmm. come up with the concept of a republic out of thin air they didn't come up out of the concept of civic virtue by themselves okay. these days they... i think like half of them don't even know who the british were <laughs> right <laughs> right you they 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 don't understand that the people who you consider as gods had gods that is absolutely yeah. lost. Your their timeline, as far as they consider the history of civilization as for, of republics, starts in 1776. Forgetting that it started 3,000 years ago. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, we're so disconnected from that here. There is there's no touchstone. You know, you, yeah. you think old, you think the old West, right? And most of that's <laughs> right. See it. Williamsburg. You go into, Williamsburg, you go into Philadelphia, parts of Philadelphia, you know, you have yep. some historical stuff, but there's no. I like, have a 17 year old daughter. She thinks the 80s were the old days. <laughs> but yeah, like, but you know, you walk through, you know, through London or, you know, you go to Greece or you go mm-hmm. you know, to Italy and you see, you know, the. I don't know, foundations, I guess, for Western culture anyway, um, you know, th- how ancient this stuff is. And there's just no, there's no touchstone here for that. And like That's you said, because people, we tore it all down. Well, yeah. Well, no, because, <laughs> because here it was nomadic. You know, it was all the, the right. people's here. Yeah. And they were like 
get the fuck out of here and just push them all yeah. on the way. Well, they did have mm-hmm. sacred lands, but we paved those over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, yeah, because it just looks like dirt. It's just desert. What do you mean? What are you talking about? You know? Right. So, yeah. It's... Well, you didn't see the etchings on the stone? Oh, we thought you were just doodling. Something about the sky <laughs> mother? You believe in a great sky mother or something? I don't know. <clears throat> but yeah, it's because when we go to school, we are taught names and numbers. And names and numbers fade from memory. Those are never going to actually stay in your system. And the problem is that we're taught those numbers and those names and never anything else. And so when those things fade, we have nothing else to re- to replace it. They need to be connected to the structure with meaning in your head. Exactly, and, but they're not. And in that in that sense, I think that it might be better to teach history backward. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, start from where you are. Do you like your television? Let's talk about what led to the television. Right. And it allows and I know you you're going to forget the inventor's it, names yeah. and you're going to forget what year it happened, but you'll know mm-hmm. roughly what century it happened and you'll know yep. the thing that came before you'll know that they had traveling puppet shows because right. that's definitely in the lineage of the television yeah right. and you know what it doesn't matter who created the television it doesn't matter if i know that because i can just look it up <laughs> <laughs> the civilization has evolved yeah yeah i mean history in that sense is one of the least useful subjects when it comes to its actual mm-hmm. content History is one of the least useful subjects. Yep. It becomes important when you begin talking about the dynamics of history. Right. Right. I mean, in a sense, you could say, like like a role-playing game. When you write a role-playing game, you send it out into the world. You have absolutely no idea what other game masters are going to do with it. And you'll, you'll never know. In most cases, yeah. you will never know. There's, there's 999,999 of them. Out of, out of a million, are not going mm-hmm. to contact you and let you know anything about the world that they created or the characters that came out of your rule system. So in a sense, you have to be completely agnostic mm-hmm. about the content that will arise. And yet you still have to take very seriously the system which gives rise to those things. In a similar way, history, if viewed from the surface, is just a meaningless parade of faces and dates that you will Mm -hmm. never remember. What's actually important are the mechanics underneath which allow human progress. And the reason we look at it is because we've made mistakes and we don't want to make them again. Mm -hmm. That's a whole lot different than memorizing the years of battles or even looking at history backward. It's more about looking at the way humans create patterns of... Mm. Anything, anything we look at, we, we patternize it, we systematize it, we come up with a means of predicting it and then controlling it. Right. We do it over and over and over again. We, you know, yep. we do it with the elements we do it with the minerals. We do it with the air. And now we're doing it with space. We're yep. doing it with quantum fucking particles. We look at the world, we break it down into a system and then we figure out how to manipulate that system. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you can you can get very specific by doing a James Burke and tracing the lineage of, of inventions from one to the next, from century mm-hmm. to century. Uh, the important thing that the kids are learning is that things leap, right? It's like mm-hmm. life goes on in a certain way, in a certain paradigm, for, and then somebody invents something or somebody writes something, and suddenly, like, boom, everything changes. You're mm-hmm. in a new paradigm. That's an important thing to notice, yeah. especially now when we live in the quote-unquote end of history where to, to kids, everything is just like an endless shopping mall. Well, you can have everything from every culture, from every time zone. It's all presented to you equally. Like my daughter appreciates Elton John, and I appreciate Elton John. Mm-hmm. But to her... I guess that's why they call it the blues hits her with the same valence as honky chateau. Mm. Uh, no, they're just two identical products on the shelf next to each other for her. Right? right. For me, they represent the the artistic development and, and I'm going to have to say 
degradation of the art of Elton John. Right? To me, it tells a narrative. To her, mm -hmm. it's just an alternate product on the shelf. Well, because so it's important you, to remember yeah, but, yeah. for kids these yeah. days the narrative part. Mm -hmm. Back well, to because story. For, I mean, for you, for you, that was that was developed over time. You mm -hmm. saw one, and then there was time that passed, and you saw the other. But going, looking back, everything is you experience everything in one moment. Yeah, because you know I can pull it. If I learn some, you learn something when you're 21, when you're 20 and 30, you see the evolution of that. It happens at different moments in time for you. Sure. And but, my for, point but I can, but if I find everything, yeah. Level, like the history as a, uh, as a metaphor or as the, mm -hmm. the object of which I'm talking, but you could apply this to different things, right? That the important stuff, the narrative stuff, like that submerged mm -hmm. iceberg metaphor comes into play again here. It's, it's the dynamics that, that you don't see that enable the stuff that you did see, that's really where the importance is. Mm -hmm. Well, when you when you talk too about, you know, we're moving along and then somebody will invent something to change something and we get this huge leap. Well, those technological leaps now come at such a rapid rate. You know, it used yeah. to be, you know, something would change and then mm -hmm. it would be static for, you know, 500 years or then 100 years or thing. And things now are rapidly changing at, at such a pace that our cultural evolution can't keep pace with that. Yeah. We have yeah. no way to reference where we are to the technology, the things that are happening around us. There's, there's no way for us to be grounded in that because you turn exactly. around. You know, you, exactly. You, Which you, is why education needs to be more abstract and, and mm -hmm. more um, situationally directed. I guess that's right. the Montessori approach, right? They give kids projects rather than lessons. Mm -hmm. And you draw lessons from the project. That makes yep. a lot more sense because it's about the how, uh, how things are done, how things work physically, how to get along with other people, mm -hmm. how to form work teams, how, yep. to, how to form consensus. Let them play yep. D&D. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, because how I mean, to, what happens? How what happens take a model now? You're, from a different yeah. field and apply it to this field because that's actually where a huge amount of technological mm -hmm. those massive leaps in history. Like if you look back at James Burke, the the moment in the show where the branch goes like woo, and you're like, whoa! I didn't think we were going to end up with that invention based on that other invention. It's almost always because an expert from one field comes into another field, mm -hmm. and he's bringing like a model of biology. You know, because maybe he used to be a biologist, but he's coming into the field of cybernetics. But his models are still biology models. Exactly. And he, he applies it to a new domain and finds something that works. Mm -hmm. That's the shit kids need to learn. How to right. apply systems and symbologies to to whatever, whatever the because you don't know what the situation is going to be. Mm -hmm. but you're going to have to form work groups. You're going to have to do research. Your experiments yep. are going to have to be reproducible. There's certain things that are going to remain true no matter what. That's what yep. we need to teach kids. Yep. But the problem that we have right now, the the way the system developed, because, and it's, I, I am I am the husband of a teacher, <laughs> and so I I I probably am biased in this statement, but for the in general, I can't I don't blame the teachers for the way that the system goes. Because they have to teach within a system. Oh, they've been given right? a shit fucking job. I mean, yeah. really, if you think so, about it, I saw a similar thing said about cops, but I'm going to put it on both cops and teachers. So basically, mm -hmm. our, our culture has reneged on any of its own responsibility for almost anything that causes problems on a sociocultural level mm -hmm. and placed them on the shoulders of police and teachers. Mm-hmm whose job should really be a lot less. Right. Right. That's why I say, so I, I, I've started this up recently, but online a lot, I, I talk about abolishing the police mm -hmm. and I don't mean get rid of them a hundred, but I don't think that we get rid of police a hundred percent. My concept behind that is that the police have been asked to do, like you said, way too much. They have been asked to do, way outside the purview of their training. 
They have been asked to be uh, psychologists, sociologists. They have been designed. They have been asked now to uh, to deal with family issues. Like yeah. if there yeah. is, if and there is typical a typical American, you're a quote unquote rugged individualist. Right. Uh, when his neighbor uh, parks his car in front of your house or uh, plays his music too loud, mm -hmm. that quote unquote rugged individualist calls men with guns to come threaten the neighbor. Okay. Right. Now I what do what do I do? I don't call the cops. I walk, walk over, over there, there and I talk to my neighbor. <laughs> right. And yet I'm the anarchist. <laughs> <laughs> right. But even look like so. If there is a domestic disturbance, right, which is clearly an emotional issue, a psychological issue, right, they call the police. A cop is not designed, he is not trained to deal with people on a, a psycho-emotional level. Oh, especially when his, when his on-the-job training consisted of the battle duty in Afghanistan. Exactly. Oh yeah. And that is, so we are asking them to do way too. There should be a therapist. There should be a person designed to deal with people yeah. on a whole nother level. Right. I mean, but we don't bother with that because what three, we do, it might've been the, the same thread. Thing, yeah. Cause I think you might've commented on one of my threads that touched mm -hmm. on this issue as well. Um, the three questions that I asked was, uh, you know, uh, one, how many times have you called the cops? Um, two, uh, of those times, uh, it, how many did, did they actually succeed in doing whatever it was you wanted without making anything worse? Mm. And in three was, and of those times, how many literally required men with guns? <laughs> right. Right. Well, and typically they're not yeah. there to prevent crime. I mean, they're there to line the coffers for the local township you know, doing speeding tickets, all that other stuff. They're not there to protect you if something happens. They're there to clean up the mess afterwards. Mm -hmm. It's an unfortunate fact, but it's the same thing with government. They're they're not looking out for you. They're not protecting you. They don't give a shit about you. No, they're actually generating money for the city is what they're doing. Yeah, yeah Through exactly. the imposition of ridiculous municipal codes and fines. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, Tucson just tried. They, I think, they just passed an ordinance that says it's illegal now to to uh, uh, um, not photograph, record a police. Well, it's unconstitutional. Like, how fucking stupid are you, city yeah, of Tucson? Right. It doesn't it doesn't work like that, <laughs> especially right. if you're in a public place. I'm not saying like you know you. Especially you when you right live up. in an era where we all have cameras in our fucking pockets. Yeah. Now, if, <laughs> right. if, if like, you know, maybe you want to establish some sort of boundary, like you can't be like, you know, right six inches from the cop recording, some, whatever, like I get it. But you can't just make a blanket statement that you can't record cops. Go fuck yourself. Like, that's just stupid. Yeah. Like, Please. you don't understand so, what's happening. <laughs> yeah. If you want to, it is so going, you know, when you said that the police are there purely to generate money for the county, for the city, a, a handful of years ago, uh, there was a debate in the Supreme Court in one of the circuits because somebody was arrested, was fined and arrested for flashing their headlights. There was a speed trap, and as you don't get people doing it anymore, and that's again the breakdown of society. And the <laughs> but, uh, but back in the day, if you saw a cop, you'd pass and you'd warn people by flashing your headlights at them. Mm -hmm. Right, and they ended up going to uh, to the Supreme Court for it, and it was deemed freedom of speech, which it should be. Sure, but why were you fighting it? Isn't the point of a street a speed trap to catch people speeding to pe catch people who are being <laughs> dangerous? Yeah, in yeah. me they were fighting flashing it my the headlights. Civilian was an anarchist doing the cop's job. Exactly. The point when I am flashing my headlights, it is getting the other person to then slow down and obey the law. Exactly. But you don't give a shit about obeying the law. You're pissed off that I just stole 150 bucks out of your pocket. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of these townships now with, 
you know, pandemic restrictions and all the stuff, everybody's being at home, all these townships and counties, their profits are, you know, in the shitter. So you're oh, going to yeah. be tax looking at higher property taxes killed. and all that stuff yep. going into next year because they've got to replace all that money somehow because nobody's driving anywhere. <laughs> but also because we have this weird idea. I mean, it happens throughout government. and It also happens in any corporation that gets federal funding. They need to justify next year's budget based on this year's budget. Mm-hmm. Right? Because the, the idea is that it's always growing. Right. And right. so, at the, and, and this works out pretty well for independent contractors like me around the end of the year. Um, if you have corporate clients or if you have uh, governmental clients, they have to spend their money by the end of the year because they want to justify their budget so they can ask for more next year. So, right, <laughs> right around the end of the year, if you're connected to the right people, you can get a lot of work. Mm-hmm. They want to spend this money real quick. Mm-hmm. Right. But let's face it, that system is fucking ridiculous. Yeah, for sure. You know, if society took a, a, a quick turn in the right direction, probably some jobs would be lost. Yeah. Probably you wouldn't have to buy so much machinery to do all the weird fucking draconian shit you're doing now. Fucking mm-hmm. radars and AI and who the fuck knows what you're spending the money on, but you're not spending on making people's lives better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, look at look at the, the the coal companies right now, right? How many billions of dollars is the U.S. government using spending to prop up a dying corporate a, a dying branch mm-hmm. of energy mm-hmm. production? Oh, this is when the one that really gets should... me. When you look at the Republicans and Libertarians who are all free market, well, okay, mm-hmm. free market. Why aren't right. those banks just fucking dead? <laughs> exactly. Right. Mm-hmm. But it's like how much what we should be doing, what you could be doing is taking those billions of dollars and instead of propping up those dying companies, let them die. If you're worried, if your big worry is, well, that's going to put thousands of people out of jobs. Take that money that you are currently spending, take it away from the companies, let them die and then give it to the people. Yeah. Let them retrain, let them reorganize, let them evolve into the new society, into the new yeah. and economy. And you know what? You know what? We can and we can release you from the onus uh, for profits to grow every year. Let's just hold right. it that exactly. level. There you go. Just hold it that fucking level. Whatever level your company yep. made it to, there you go. That's it. Yep. Yep. But let the problem the is it talks yeah. that money. Yep. It would have come from the government anyway, which means it would have come from the taxpayers anyway. Right. So let it go straight to the employees. What the fuck? There was mm-hmm. a reason we built all these machines. We started building machines so that human labor would be less terrible and less necessary. Mm-hmm. Right. And now we're there. So right. let's have a fucking party and all you know, only work if you want to and let the machines do it. Right. Yep. But the problem is that the power structure is set up. Like you said before, it's set up to prop up a small handful of people. So we could take billions and billions of dollars and prop up millions of people. But instead we choose to take those billions of dollars and prop up a handful of people. Because shoving yeah, money and that into handful an industry, of people, by the way, it's not the same as propping up. Oh, I don't know, uh, an an energy company who at least provides something, right? Yeah. Right. The the banks and brokers, they're not fucking. They don't create anything. Nope. They spin <laughs> money into more money. That's all they do. They fool yep. people into making bad investments, mm-hmm. and turn money into more money. That's all they do. Right. I mean, if you want it, the the best example of that with a uh, or an example is the the small business loans that went out a couple of months ago. They handed them to the banks, and what do the banks do? They turn it around so that they could make the most off of those investments. Of course, it wasn't used to help the people. That's what like happens it was when you to. give money to bankers? Like 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 right. people don't know this, <laughs> <laughs> right? It's like over in over in Europe. 
they didn't give like they did the same exact thing. They invested money into the economies. But in order to do it, they didn't give the money to a private organization to then dole out. What they did is gave the money directly to the businesses that hire the people. Mm -hmm. So they didn't have an influx of unemployment. Mm -hmm. They didn't have all of these businesses suddenly going out, going under because they were giving the money to the business to supply the um, employees. So the businesses did not have to fire people. They didn't have to lay people off. There wasn't a huge influx of unemployment. And the banks didn't get to make money. Right. It was I mean, a the direct, rest of the world is looking at, I saw a tweet the other day that said the rest of the world is looking at America, watching America right now, the way America watched that Tiger King. Tiger King. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, yep. well, look, dude, are you are you concerned about unemployment? Are you concerned about the financial repercussions? It can't be both. Right. <laughs> It can't be both. And we know we're on the verge of, of you know, 50% automation. Let's just mm -hmm. fucking do it. Just fucking do it. This is one right. place where the accelerationists are right. I mean, so so capitalism uh, falls apart. Oh, no. Boo-hoo. You know, but meanwhile, that's why we built all these machines. So we wouldn't have to work. Exactly. Yep. Oh, uh, well. So on that note, <laughs> uh, we should probably wrap. It's been two and a half hours. <laughs> I think that's that's a, a pretty good place to wrap up. Black Lives Matter. Yeah, yeah. which doesn't mean that nobody else does. So yep. don't be stupid. <laughs> like, I think so. In summation, I had a, I had a friend, uh, be piece, empathetic. He wanted to get Eat this the as a bumper sticker, which, like, if this would be a great general rule for everybody to follow. Like, if we only had one rule, I'd nominate this rule, Rick White's rule. Don't be stupid, okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yep. You know what? Go, ahead, go out and talk to people. I mean, I, I, there's an African-American right. guy I work with, and, you know, we're, you know, friendly enough for, like, work stuff. And I guess the day after they murdered George Floyd... Uh, I, you know, I saw the video somewhere and I'm like, fuck, did you see the shit? And he was like, yeah. And, you know, we had a, a conversation and then, you know, once all the protests and stuff started, I went and I made a point to go grab him during the day. And I said, look, I didn't even talk to, you know, for everybody and I don't speak for everybody, but like, fuck, like, what, like, what do you want to see? Like, what, what do you want me to do? Like, what, like, what are we doing? Like, obviously I don't hate you and you don't hate me. So like this, this is not an issue, but like, systemically like you know what are you know what are we talking about you know and then we talked for about an hour and then just you know ran through some stuff and you know he appreciated me coming to talk to him and you know like that's like a first step you know make sure you're talking to people and being out of the community and doing stuff and you know so i you know sort of broke out of like hey we're not going to do the politics thing and you know started jumping in like sharing stuff and tweeting stuff and retweeting stuff and like just being you know, more active that way. We don't have a huge platform, but, you know, we do have a, a bit of a platform. So let's, you know, if I talk about moving the ball forward, like, did, did we not do this in 1968 already? Like what, like what the fuck, you know, yeah, and, we, and we did, but what you're talking about is generational and it's important for, for Gen Xers and boomers is important for people of our age to unlearn some of the lessons that we learned Mm -hmm. in our youth right and um one of those has to do with the public image we were taught that on a business level on a website or in the public sphere it's i'm okay you're okay everything's fine oh we're doing great right and you could be you could be heartbroken you could be devastated you could be financially struggling but you keep that on the inside mm -hmm. well that's that's not the way a community works that's not the way a a caring society works and the millennials and gen z they know it mm -hmm. um i used to keep that line um that firm line between my political life and my professional life and all you'd ever see on my twitter or my facebook would be stuff related to my games or science fiction or futurism and last year i decided fuck it i fuck it 
I put the word anarchist in my bio on Twitter and I started tweeting political. Well, guess what? I got a lot more followers and a fucking every day I have an interesting conversation. It's because Twitter has become so much better now that my political views are open for discussion. Right. Well, it's a, I there was a there's a YouTube channel that I follow that took it all just it's just about comic books and the history of comic books, right? And the guy said for forever, for years, he's been running this he's been running this channel for about four or five years now, and he has said that for the longest time, he tried to keep himself separate, just mm-hmm. like you just like you just said, right? But he realized that it hurts to do that (laughs) and it hurt to 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 it's pointless in the end to attempt to itemize yourself like that and it's all the only thing it does is just hurt you to try to it dehumanizes to try to pull exactly to try to pull yourself back corporations do right corporation is a fake person that says we care for you no you fucking don't it's a Mm -hmm. goddamn lie is what it is it's the same fucking thing it's a goddamn lie Mm -hmm. you are not okay you are not doing fine yep you're a person you're a real person and and the audience these days younger people these days they don't want to see you do the fake we care they want to see mm-hmm. you be a real fucking person who maybe cries once in a while. Right. Because black lives matter. That's it. All right. I'm not going to do any commercials because that seems uh, gratuitous and dirty. So uh, we'll end it on that. I appreciate everybody checking it out. This is... If you made it all the way through, thank you for listening all the way through. This is uh, definitely not one we typically go to, but I well, I guess maybe we're going to see some more of this in the future as we move forward because uh, this is clearly important. I mean, we can't just murder uh, you know, a part of the population on a regular basis without any sort of ramification. I mean, this is hmm. ridiculous uh, in, in any sense of the word. So uh, thanks, everybody, and we'll uh, catch you next time. Peace. Peace.